Welcome, everyone. Thank you for, for joining us bright and early uh, on a Friday morning. Um, we are hosting this symposium on building, uh, bringing transparency to digital political campaigns. And so we're delighted to have a day-long investigation of these issues uh, from multiple different perspectives. And uh, I'd like to start by first thanking Jean Butcher, our extraordinary uh, organizer, event organizer for pulling this all together and helping us uh, make this possible. Also, my co-organizers, Rebecca Weiss and Christelle Sono, uh, who've helped pull this event together. So very, very grateful for that. Uh, this is a joint event from Princeton's Center for Information Technology Policy and the Center for the Study of Democratic Politics. Uh, we are both centers uh, at Princeton. Uh, we at CITP are crossed between the engineering school and the policy school, and uh, we're trying to understand and improve the relationship between technology and digital society. And so something like this event that concerns elections, transparency, and the use of online communication platforms is sort of right up in the middle of, of what we do and what we care about. And we're, we're really grateful to, to all of you to, to be part of this. Um, so we'll be having four panel discussions followed by Q&A. Uh, really, our goal for this event is to start a conversation as early as we can to connect political scientists, communication scholars, campaign strategists, and computer scientists who are examining all these issues to start to think about how do we work together to bring, to bring a public interest perspective into the campaign landscape. Uh, how do we ensure that the public has an ability to understand how campaigns are operating and what platforms are doing. So without further ado, let me turn it over to the first moderator, Andy Guest. Thanks a lot. Um, thanks a lot, Mihir. Um, I'm Andy Guest. I'm an assistant professor of politics and public affairs, uh, and I'm affiliated with both CS CSDP and the CITP, and I'm very pleased to be um, <laughs> Pleased to be uh, dealing with some technical difficulties. Um, <laughs> I don't know what you're saying. Sorry. Um, I'm not, if someone could come and just take a look yes. at that while I talk. Uh, so I want to just introduce my panel, uh, our panel, which is, uh, consists of uh, some folks who come at this topic from a, a few slightly different angles. So we have researchers and we have practitioners. So. I'm um, really excited to get this conversation started. So I just want to um, briefly introduce each person on the panel. So um, all the way on your left, we have Nailette Brodnax, who's an assistant professor in uh, the McCourt School of Public Policy at Georgetown University. Um, and she, uh, so she, she does uh, a lot of computational social science research um, and her substantive interests include education policy, uh, policy diffusion, data science, uh, and uh, program evaluation, um, and, and I know that you've you've done a lot of you, you've analyzed Facebook uh, ads data, so I'm excited to hear what you um, you know what you've learned from that research. Um, in the middle, we have Saul uh, Solomon Messing, um, who has had a variety of uh, positions uh, in both industry uh, and uh, and academic research. Uh, most recently, um, was uh, at the Discovery Data Science Organization at Twitter. Um, and uh, he, uh, wor he worked on teams uh, that focused on relevance, ranking, the home timeline, um, as well as the applied sciences group within, within Twitter. Uh, before that, uh, he was uh, the director of the, uh, the data labs at Pew Research Center and was a research scientist at Facebook as well. Um, okay, so and then next to Solomon uh, it, uh, is Kevin Munger, uh, who is an assistant professor at Penn State. Uh, Kevin uh, studies digital media. Um, he writes about a lot of topics, um, uh, in, including uh, including topics related to digital campaigning. Um, he uh, thinks a lot about social science and how we can actually learn from experiments that study things like campaign effects. Um, and uh, he's also my, the co-founder with me and Esther Harditai, um, also CITP fellow uh, of a journal of quantitative description. Uh, and then on Zoom, uh, we have Katie, Katie Harbath. Um, hi, Katie. Thank you so much for joining us uh, remotely. Um, Katie is the, the founder and CEO of Anchor Change, um, and, uh, so, uh, which means, uh, among other things, that um, uh, she works through tech policy issues um, with uh, various clients uh, 
uh, including in the campaign world. And before that, uh, Katie was um, the policy, uh, a public policy director at uh, Facebook, where I believe uh, you worked directly with um, campaigns and helping them to um, you know, get the most out of the uh, tools uh, offered by the, the platform. Um, so uh, we want to give each of our panelists um, just a few minutes, maybe, to to start us off with, um, you know, some of their own some of their own thoughts, kind of based on their own kind of work and their own experience, um, to get us get us started, and so we can all sort of ground um, our discussion in their individual perspectives. So maybe we could start with um, Nailette, if if you don't mind. Okay, sure. Thank you. Um, thank you, Andy, for that introduction. Um, so I am going to talk a little bit about um, campaigns use of platforms and um, this is work that I did with um, Piotr Sapajinski who is a computer scientist at Northeastern and um, we started out with um, this question of how are campaigns using uh, digital ads on platforms like Facebook. There was a lot of research that focused on um, users and how users were impacted by ads and how they were engaging with different um, political ideas on the platforms. And so we said, well, what's happening with campaigns? And when we started to look at how campaigns were advertising, we saw that um, in, in the past 10 years or so, there had been this big drop in television advertising and a movement to other platforms. Um, there had always been you know, other, other areas like print media and radio and so forth, but what you see is this, this big drop off in television and a big increase in advertising on digital platforms. So we collected uh, about 600,000 Facebook ads that were posted by um, presidential candidates during the 2020 primary season. Uh, and this is so that we would have a large number of candidates um, rather than during the election when you, when you only have um, a couple major candidates. So um, looking at those, we uh, started to try and understand on Facebook, what were they doing? And at the time, the Facebook ad archive only provided delivery statistics. So you could see uh, for a given campaign, what, um, how much roughly was being spent on the ads, um, how many impressions there were associated with those ads, and some, some very high level demographic information about who was actually seeing the ads. Um, so at the time you couldn't get uh, uh, targeting information and now Facebook has started to release that information um, beginning over the summer. Uh, but not retroactively, unfortunately. But um, but we figured there's enough of a correspondence between uh, targeting and delivery that we could learn something meaningful. So we had a few hypotheses going into this analysis of the of the ad data. Um, looking at the candidates, many of them. First of all, we picked candidates that um, we considered to be major candidates. So they were getting at least a hundred thousand um, in. Uh, and contributions and would be, you know, recognized by um, polling organizations and the media and so forth. Um, there actually are hundreds of presidential primary candidates. Um, we focus on the big ones. So we had 26. Most of them are politicians. We had a few uh, governors, some some senators and representatives, um, some state representatives, a few mayors, and then a few candidates who. Um, had not held political office. And we looked at those with a few, few different hypotheses. Um, first, we imagined that based on the literature that, that these candidates would try to draw on their existing networks. So um, maybe they are, are really targeting um, people that are in their home states, right? Because this is where they already have, um, that where they're already well known. We also wondered, well, maybe they are targeting potential voters in swing states so that when they get to the general election, if they actually win the primary, they kind of already have this um, building movement and, and groups of people that already are familiar with them. And then the third hypothesis we had was, well, maybe they are targeting uh, states that have early primaries because there's this idea of momentum if primary candidates can 
establish themselves as um, having some success early in the primary that that carries them through to the end. And so we're looking at states like um, Iowa's caucuses and New Hampshire and uh, some of the other states leading right up into uh, Super Tuesday where there's a big group of states that have their uh, primaries in early March. Um, we looked at the ads relative to basically on a per capita basis, right? We would expect that campaigns are going to um, uh, target more in places where there are more people. So using that relative measure of reach, if you will, uh, we found a, a huge increase in spending in home states. So that was our first hypothesis. And this was pretty interesting because when you look at uh, television advertising, you don't really see that kind of uh, concentrated pattern. And so our sense is that campaigns are basically using this uh, platform early in the primary season to raise money. Um, they're targeting uh, people who are likely to donate to their campaigns. Um, the ads themselves will typically have links where you know people can make contributions. And so this really is part of a, a broader movement of trying to get uh, a large number of small donors. And that's another shift that we've seen uh, in recent election years. Um, we didn't really see much of an emphasis on swing states. But we did see that over time, over the course of the primary season, or leading up to the beginning of the actual uh, races, that campaigns were also spending lots and lots of money in Iowa and New Hampshire. Uh, so, you know, what does this mean? Um, well, we believe that um, this shift to digital platforms is part of a contributor to the large number of candidates that we see during the primary. Uh, because television advertising is expensive and it takes a lot of time to, uh, to set up. You have to purchase these slots well in advance of when they're going to air. There are a limited number of markets that the slots can, um, can get access to viewers. And so um, while you know, targeting for television has become more sophisticated over time, but it's really this combination of being able to raise money from small donors and being able to target users on a very, very granular basis that has allowed candidates who probably in, in past elections wouldn't have been able to um, participate and, and actually make a name for themselves. And so on one hand, we talk a lot about uh, the harms of, of digital platforms, but you could also argue that um, this is is beneficial to democracy to potentially have um, more candidates who are able to get in front of uh, donors, contributors, and uh, prospective voters. Um, so I'll just wrap up saying there's a lot more to be done. There's certainly some limitations. Um, certainly we want to go back and look at uh, the targeting information, which at this stage is, is fairly limited, but um, that's something we'll be looking at in the future. And, um, and also trying to understand how uh, candidates and campaigns are using other platforms. And the other interesting thing, there are thousands of political advertisers on Facebook, and we're only looking at a subset. Um, and in our case, we focused on the presidential election, but certainly you have the um, uh, state and local elections and other um, federal races for Congress. So there's a lot of work to be done to understand um, what these patterns look like in the future. Thank you. Great, thanks a lot. Um, so so uh, Solomon, um, do you want to go? Do you have, do you have slides? Uh, or Yeah, okay. I, I, I do. All right. Uh, okay. okay, sure. Yeah, Katie, do you want to go next? Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, sorry, I couldn't be there in person. Are you guys able to hear me? Oh, yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, please let me. Okay, great. Um, I kind of want to take a step back um, and maybe talk a bit more about that evolution of how we're seeing campaigns use different. Sorry. Yeah, you're good. Okay. Um, how we see campaigns use different digital tools for campaigning. Um, Earlier this fall, I put out through the Bipartisan Policy Center 
and we'll look at tech and elections going back 26 years to the first uh, campaign websites that were happening in 1996. And going through, you know, the spurt after 2004, um, where you really did start to see platforms like Facebook and YouTube and Twitter start to get utilized um, a lot more by, by campaigns. That was when I was doing Republican uh, digital politics and, and all of that. Um, and I really feel like right now we're sort of in a similar time, we're in a similar phase to where we were in those early, two, early 2000s and kind of through 2015 where campaigns were trying a lot of different platforms and stuff in order to try to reach voters and in order to try to uh, fundraise, get email addresses, all of those different, those different types of things. And what I saw this cycle is, and what I've heard from, from different campaigns and stuff is um, less of a reliance on, on things like Facebook um, and, and Google. Um, many platforms such as like Twitter and TikTok don't even allow political advertising right now. And what we've heard is um, that there's been a big shift to streaming. Uh, platforms. Some of this too is because of the transparency efforts that the platforms like Facebook and others have definitely put in um, that they are moving to these other platforms where they have the ability to do uh, the micro-targeting that they might not be able to do on those other platforms anymore. And I think this is less of a reason, but some of them because they don't have the transparency either, which I think is very frustrating. Um, has to be for many of you in the room, and it's something that I think we need to be paying a lot more attention to. This cycle as well, and I think we'll see this also going into 2024, is that you just had people being on a lot more different platforms. You had the introduction of now platforms like Gitter and Twitter and social media on the right. Um, you definitely did see the left using uh, TikTok more from an organic perspective. Um, you also saw the rise of the use of, I think, podcasts and radio um, and, and just many other different forms of ways for people to, and campaigns to try to get advertising out there. You're also starting to see the rise of paid influencers. And so campaigns, um, you know, not actually doing the transactions through the platforms at all, but are actually paying influencers in order to, to push various messages about them, which is much harder to track. Um, and I think will continue to be a challenge for us as we continue to move forward, um, move forward in, this, in this space. You also saw this cycle, um, for those of you that were paying super close attention, issues such as the Republicans accusing Google of um, putting their emails into spam and Google trying their, um, their new pilot out to, for campaigns to be able to have their, campaign, their emails go right into the, the inbox, which will be an interesting uh, phenomenon to, to keep an eye out on. Um, you also saw the continued increased use of text messaging. Um, talking to a lot of campaigns, they found that text messaging um, was still very uh, fruitful in terms of helping them to, to raise money and stuff like that. But we have, definitely did see also kind of just a decline in the amount of small dollar fundraiser, um, small dollar donors, excuse me, toners, um, and, and the effectiveness of email that I think is something I'm keeping an eye on as we continue to move forward in, in 2024, um, and, and what has the sort of uh, constant barrage that people have been going through and getting messages of getting messages from campaigns over the many, many years, um, how is that gonna change as we continue to go into to 04, and what does that mean for, for a lot of candidates who just had their own fundraising small dollar bases, um, and will that, will that continue, particularly um, Sure, one we're all keeping a very close eye on is how that will work for, for President Trump going forward. Um, last things I'll just say is that I think that um, how the internet looks this time in 2024 is very different than what it's gonna look like today. Just look at how much has already somewhat changed with just the five weeks or so that Elon Musk has had, has had Twitter, um, the challenges that TikTok is going to face, um, not just in the US, but other places. We have um, questions of you know how the judiciary is going to rule on court cases like Gonzalez and others, and also the Florida and Texas rules that could really change the effectiveness of some of these platforms and where campaigns can campaigns can go. Advertising is going to continue to change more of Apple's and Google's 
um, changes continue to be to be enacted um, and stuff like that. And so I think that, um, and we're going to have new platforms. You know, people are trying out ones now, like Mastodon, which is completely decentralized. You have ones like Post.News. It's too soon to say that you know who's going to be the dominant platform as we go into to 2024. But I think that. Just like I said, we kind of saw in that mid to late 2000s, I do think we'll see campaigns experimenting with a lot of different platforms and advertising, um, um, advertising ways to advertise, excuse me, I need more coffee this morning, um, ways to advertise that um, it could look very different than what campaigns looked like online, um, even this cycle or even in 2016. So I'll leave it there and I'm, I'm happy to take questions and uh, curious to hear what the other panelists have to say. Uh, hey everyone, I'm Saul Messing. Um, so in uh, the 2020 election, um, I was the chief scientist at Acronym, which is a 501c3 flavored sort of dark money uh, uh, left-leaning group. Uh, and um, I, I got involved in this actually because uh, a friend of mine who I'd known from, from Facebook, James Barnes, um, came to me. What, he was the 2016 uh, Embed in the Trump uh, campaign. And in 2020, he, he wanted to redeem himself. And so he asked me to, to join his, uh, to his organization and, and kind of lead the data science group there. Um, and, so, and so essentially what I'm going to try to do today is give a little bit of an insider's perspective, so to speak, uh, uh, based mostly on my experience with the 2020 campaign. Um, and the, the other thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to focus on measurement tools in particular with respect to how that affects campaign strategy. Um, <clears throat> and I'm sort of like, I think probably halfway, you should, you should think about me as sort of halfway between uh, practitioner and researcher for, for the purposes of this. Okay. Slide. Oh, I have the clicker. <laughs> Whoops. Uh, okay. So the first thing I want to talk about is, is, is measurement uh, with respect to fundraising. Fundraising measurement is actually pretty easy. You've got this nice uh, dollar measure. It's very well powered. Uh, these, these platforms are designed to optimize on this measure for, for sales for a bunch of different things, and that essentially extends directly to, to fundraising. Uh, it's also true that like there's a bunch of tools that, that are easy to use in this space that campaigns can use. Uh, there's there's an, an entire community on the web that sort of talks about how to, how to do this. It's very advanced uh, uh, on the sort of math side and, and on the sort of usage side. It's a mature product. Um, Trump, uh, was very good at this in, in 2016, uh, and, and pretty much everyone agrees that Trump was better than, than Clinton, perhaps in part to uh, the, the aforementioned uh, uh, connection between the Trump campaign and the, the platform itself. Uh, so um, that's, that's awesome. Uh, in 2020, uh, though, uh, when, when James and I sort of tried to, to, to um, you know, uh, tried our hand in, in politics in 2020, we wanted to, to focus on persuasion rather than on fundraising. And the reason is because we had a bunch of money already, um, mainly. Uh, the thing about it, though, is that persuasion measurement is actually very, very hard. Um, people lie to you. There's, there's all kinds of issues that come up with respect to the, the quality of the data. There's, there's data loss. There's a lot of messiness all over the place, um, uh, and that's just if you're 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 doing a the, the typical approach, which is a survey experiment where you show half the people one ad and half the people the other, and immediately ask how they feel about it. Uh, we didn't want to do that in part because you get these sort of very transient effects uh, when you're trying to to measure what's actually happening uh, or what might happen in the real world. That's not a really good way to do it. You want to do something that's more like a field experiment. So that's what we did. We, we actually had in-house, our in-house sort of uh, creative shop produce messages. We tested them in, on Facebook uh, using custom audience matching. Uh, and then we, we ran surveys on Facebook. Uh, we also ran pre-surveys, by the way, uh, to, to increase statistical power. And still, it was very, very hard. We had a $10 million budget for experiments in data science. And that is way more than we're ever going to get in the academy. And we still had a lot of trouble with power. Uh, we still had a lot of trouble getting like the, the, the right samples and, and whatnot. 
Um, and forget about heterogeneous treatment effects, right? Forget about micro-targeting. If you're in that kind of environment, you are not going to be able to uh, measure differences in persuasion across small groups. Um, there are plenty of tools available for, for targeting. Facebook has this tool. It probably looks totally different now. Uh, but this is what it looked like in, in 2020, their, their targeting interface. Um, the, the voter file itself contains, which is what campaigns often use as the basis for targeting, contains a lot of variables that you might want to use for, for targeting. Um, but again, the effects are tiny. You're, not, you're never going to be able to know if you're actually affecting one group more than another in that environment. Uh, so uh, speaking of which, does any of this stuff work at all is kind of an interesting question that we wanted to, to, to address. Uh, with this sort of data science group that we put together. The, the, this is, there's this Mark Melman quote, which is, uh, which is very apt, which he uses to describe attempts to measure this, which is, you know, two groups uh, were randomly assigned. One group had a potato chip. The groups were retested. You really expect to see a difference, a meaningful difference in health across the two groups. No, it's just one little potato chip. Uh, likewise, if you're just looking at the effect of one ad, maybe you shouldn't expect to, to see very much in a, in a campaign. So what we did is we said, okay, we're going to give people like a lot of potato chips. We're going we're gonna, to uh, uh, have this uh, random, randomly assigned holdout for a giant campaign. Two million people, uh, nine months, uh, or sorry, eight months, nine million dollar campaign for, for swing state voters in the 2020 election. That's what we were... That's what we were doing at Acronym. And uh, we still find very, very, very small effects. If you look at this figure on the right of the screen, you can see the, the average treatment effect across Trump support score. Remember, we're expecting to see differential turnout here. So we're expecting to see the treatment uh, group uh, uh, be or have higher turnout rates among people who didn't support Trump, right, and, and, and vice versa. And that's actually what we see, but the effect is just tiny. It's just tiny for this giant campaign. This is not one or two ads, this is a whole campaign. Uh, we, we actually, so like, interestingly, for the purposes of this particular figure, notice that the early vote data right there on the left actually shows a much stronger effect. You, I can't see it very well. You probably can if you're staring at the screen. Um, uh, so the effect is concentrated among folks who voted early. Now, this was a pre-registered study and this was not a pre-registered finding, so there's a little bit of caveat there. But that the point of the matter is that the, the, it's early voting that we ought to be paying attention to. We think this is because there's saturation effects as you get closer and closer to election day when everyone is advertising to avoid decay effects, right? <laughs> so essentially what's happening um, is, that, is that COVID introduced this crazy shock to the way that political campaigning works, and now early voting actually seems to probably matter a lot more, or early campaigning probably matters a lot more than it did in the, in the past because of early voting. Uh, that's, that's, I think, one of the coolest things about some of that work that we did. Um, the, the last point I want to touch on, and then I'll, I'll sort of, we'll, we'll, go, we'll, you know, move on here, is this point about earned versus paid media. Katie uh, talked a little bit uh, about this in terms of the, the influencers and, and kind of, you know, non-official campaigning. Uh, but one of the most effective things that, that we think that we found in this very difficult measurement environment, uh, this is going back to our field experiments our weekly failed Facebook field experiments, um, is that Boosted News, which is promoted content, seemed to work as well as, if not better than, uh, actual like produced creative. It's very expensive to produce creative, so it's actually kind of an important and interesting finding. We, um, we actually ran a lot of Boosted News in our overall campaign uh, because of the sort of cost benefit here. Um, and, and so, you know, it's really important as, as this becomes more and more prominent to, to pay attention to this stuff and not just focus on conventional advertising. Uh, uh, I think 
you know, both of these panelists, everyone, everyone probably agrees with me. We'll see what Kevin has to say. <laughs> anyway, um, point is, is that uh, this is, this is, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip over the example because um, that's, that's sort of like, uh, we need to save time here. The point, the point that I want to make is that um, earned media is just increasing in importance or at least in terms of the, uh, the, the prominence of it, that the media covers candidates, and, and, and in particular, you know, Trump has been very good at getting earned media. That's the giant bar over there, um, uh, far better than Clinton, uh, uh, and, and this has you know, probably helped him, at least in the primary, right? And how do you get earned media? Well, <laughs> you say things that are unexpected or that are outrageous because that's what that's what is newsworthy. And so Trump seems to be very good at, at this. Now, <laughs> that's not to say that every candidate out there should necessarily go and sort of say outrageous things, but I think it is worth paying attention to the broad strategy of getting earned media uh, through social media or through other non-official means and we should try very hard to attempt to capture the impact of that as we kind of do more and more research in this space uh uh okay to sum things up uh measuring donations is is easy relatively easy it's not easy uh measuring persuasion is very very hard especially in presidential elections micro targeting for persuasion is probably not a thing uh, in fact, one of my co-authors on this study, Alex Kopic, has research suggesting that there are essentially no heterogeneous, heterogeneous treatment effects in persuasion at all. Um, you should read that work. It's published in Science Advances. It's a good paper. Um, yeah. Lastly, earned media seems to be as effective as paid in presidential elections, at least in, this, in 2020. Uh, and uh, yeah, this suggests that the in terms of strategy, not tactics, but in terms of strategy at least, campaigns maybe should consider operating a little bit more like Trump and a little bit less like Clinton and, and Biden. Okay, that concludes what I have to say. Thank you. All right. That was, that was a good hot take. So Kevin, uh, you can pick up the baton there. Bye. Yeah, thanks. Uh, this is a great panel. I'm happy to be following up on what has been said thus far because I agree with much of it. So I want to first highlight a point that Katie made about 2024 potentially being very different, even from today. And I think this is a kind of defining problem for the way in which we as social scientists or practitioners are trying to learn from the past, accumulate the knowledge that we have gained, and then figure out how to apply it. So it does seem that the situation is changing very rapidly, such that some of the traditional, at least academic tools for studying these systems are not up to the task. And so, so, so this is, it's perhaps a pat story, right? But you, you mentioned that in 2016, it, it looked like the Trump campaign did better on Facebook than the Clinton campaign did. And you mentioned that that was because, or at least possibly because, the Trump campaign had an embed from Facebook working with them. My understanding is that this was not offered only to the Trump campaign. It was offered to both campaigns. The Clinton campaign had far more digital expertise at that point. So they had done a lot of research. And because of their expertise gained under Obama, they realized that Facebook was a waste of time that it was all about email. So my read of the situation is that they were mistaken because the world had changed. And by trusting too much in the accumulated knowledge from a different context, they made poor strategic decisions about how to use digital tools. So I think this is a you know, extremely fundamental epistemological problem that we're not really gonna be able to solve now. but. It has pushed me to think about these things a little bit less empirically and a little more theoretically in an attempt to, I guess, if, if all of our knowledge is empirical, it's all from the past. And if we're concerned that the future is so different from the past, 
that it might not be that applicable, that represents a problem. And so some more theoretical work, I think, is helpful for at least pointing us in the direction of where to be looking. And um, the, what I wanted to talk about has already been mentioned, the rise of the politician influencer and the idea of earned media as a crucial new strategy which is largely, it's not just difficult to measure, it's unrelated to most of what we have measured in the past. So most of our knowledge about how digital campaigns work is not that useful to understanding this process. So at a very high level, I think that the rise of the ubiquity of social media represents the fulfillment of some prediction by media theorists about the rise of a secondary orality, the, the return of oral culture and the increased importance of charisma as a skill in politics and campaigning. Now, this charisma doesn't necessarily look exactly the same as charisma in the past. So one of the longstanding theories in American politics and campaigns is home style. So this is the idea of a, a member of Congress needing to talk about what they do in Washington with their constituency. And this takes the form of being aware of what's going on in your district, being able to credibly signal, I have not betrayed you, I have not become a Washington insider, I am still someone from this region. And so if you go to eat a cheesesteak in South Philly, you have to be sure what kind of cheese to order on that. These are the kind of uh, you know, faux pas that certain politicians have made, which I think illustrates a lack of the traditional conception of home style. Because this home style is so geographic, right? So the regionalism around which the House of Representatives is premised, the idea that it's actually important to have people from every geographic part of the country in Washington is built into the institutions of Congress and thus into campaigning. But as the politics has become increasingly nationalized, the way in which we select uh, political candidates and the way in which they win these races has become much less regional. And so I have been working on adapting this idea of home style to be digital home style. And so there are still particular ways of talking in which a politician can signal to a constituency that they are on their side. So in particular, if you are using digital media tools well in a way that in particular, young people can identify with, they see you as someone who understands them. Whereas if you try to use them and do so poorly, um, first of all, you're not going to get very much attention uh, and the earned media that we've seen is possibly going to be much more important, but also they're going to be alienated from you. And so this, the importance of selecting candidates who have this digital campaigning skills and online charisma, I think, is only going to grow. And you can sort of think of it as analogous to there was a, uh, a rash of billionaire candidates because people thought that being able to spend a bunch of your own money was going to be a big advantage in winning office. Charisma and the politician influencer represents a kind of in-kind donation to your own campaign in the form of this extremely valuable earned media. I think it also changes the strategic calculus between the political party and the individual politicians. So precisely because these candidates no longer need to work within a party machine, but can connect directly with the voters and indeed get small dollar donations from voters outside of their district, they are not as beholden to the institutional powers of the two parties. So thinking about the, the, the two best examples of this are Trump and AOC, each of whom have established alternative and direct relationship with voters and significant sources of money and influence outside of the parties, allowing each of these politicians to accelerate their competition with the uh, party institution. So this does not produce an obvious prediction about what's going to happen. This is changing the strategic calculus at a more institutional level. Um, so in addition to the behavioral stuff we're talking about, I think that this is going to be quite different in the future. Finally, I think that the way that we are thinking about generating knowledge through running experiments and then 
having a bunch of numbers at the end of it and then having a PDF with the numbers in it is useful. I still like doing this. But I think that there is a skill that involves posting, which allows for a form of learning that is more embodied and immediate. So the idea of posting and then getting direct feedback from people telling you if that was good or not represents a kind of epistemological approach that only these charismatic politicians have access to. So precisely because they are able to, in the attention economy of the digital platforms, they're able to turn themselves into attentional black holes and focus all the feedback on themselves. They are able to get a lot more information when they act in terms of the feedback that they get. So I think Trump did this extremely well in 2016 where he was able to feel out the audience and successfully understand what issues in the Republican primary base were not being spoken to by the party establishment. I think you know, we're seeing this happen with Elon Musk today. This is his approach to running Twitter, is to do stuff and then have people tell him if it's a good idea or not. And people who are nominally critical of him are falling over themselves to give him feedback for free. And so I think if you are able to post and, I guess, embrace the fact that people might say mean things about you on the internet, but in exchange for that, you are able to warp the attentional economy around yourself and get this immediate feedback. It represents a new kind of campaign um, strategy and informational uh, acquisition that is extremely powerful and I think will continue to be so in the future. So, thanks. Thanks a lot. Uh, okay, that was great. So, um, we'll get to questions in a second. Hold, 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 hold that thought. Um, I do think that Kevin has said a bunch of things that probably each of our panelists could could respond to. So I'm actually just going to uh, offer that opportunity to do that right now. So maybe Katie, uh, starting with you. So um, Kevin touched on a number of the uh, of points that that you also made. Um, I think both of you sort of highlighted um, the fact that it it seems that the sort of digital campaigning landscape, uh, especially with regard to the platforms. Uh, is going to be more unsettled in the in the upcoming um, presidential campaign in the U.S. than it has been uh, for for some time, uh, and I guess so. Kevin mentioned a number of dimensions in which uh, which could be affected, but one that that occurred to me also that I thought you might be able to speak to is uh, whether uh, whether the fact that things are going to be more unsettled is going to be less um, accumulated institutional knowledge to go on. Do you think that could benefit uh, like incumbents, more established? Candidates or or outsiders or uh, or is it still or is it still not clear? It benefits anybody who's more willing to be experimentative um, and to, to try different things and be okay with failing, which usually comes more from outsider candidates who don't have as much of a target on their back. But that being said, when you have a candidate like Trump, who does obviously has never acted like an establishment. Uh, candidate uh, and may not care about that as much. Um, that for somebody like him, I think it's a question of does he get the same type of digital staffers and folks willing to work with him that are going to have that ability to to think about and utilize the new platforms versus the stuff they're most the stuff they're most comfortable with. Um, and so, but I think in general, yes, it generally tends to, to favor newer folks on the on the field um, who are more willing to take risks. Uh, thanks a lot. Um, so, Nayla, I was wondering if you wanted to uh, respond to some of what we've heard so far as well. Um, you know, in particular, um, you know, the way that uh, these technological changes um, are affecting the way that candidates connect to their constituents, right? Um, you've, um, uh, and, and you also sort of suggested that um, not only um, sort of the types of people who, who are going to run and take advantage of these uh, uh, tools, but also even the number, uh, the number of candidates uh, could be affected. So I'm curious um, if you know you have any thoughts as well about how the sort of the you know potential the the dynamics of the situation uh, might might also affect like the, the character or the types of, of of candidates who might be running. Yeah, so I think um, it's also linked to this idea of um, oh. <laughs> thanks. I think it's also linked to this idea of. Um, digital home style that that Kevin brought up in the sense that um, and the theory that 
is falling apart from political science because we would say young people don't vote and then we just had a midterm season where young people voted and so um, I think that's going to mean that more candidates are going to pay attention to that and try to experiment and figure out how they can um, reach young voters in a way that they perhaps didn't focus on um, and I think it'll f further pull them away from uh, from television and more um, into that place of experimentation. And so candidates who have some kind of um, charisma or more of, of uh, connected to influencers and different ways of reaching out, I think will be more likely to put their hat in the ring because they know that these mechanisms for raising money, which they would be at a disadvantage, um, will, will be more effective and they'll be less reliant on uh, you know, party endorsements, for example, which we, we would say are very important, um, but that may not necessarily be the case. And I think we were likely to see that for, uh, for 2024 as well. Okay. Thanks. That makes a lot of sense. Um, okay. So, and then uh, Saul, um, we've heard a lot of talk uh, about uh, different forms of experimentation <clears throat> that, we, that uh, candidates might be practicing, um, that campaigns might, might, might be doing. As someone who's done a bunch of experiments, um, are you are you intrigued by by these notions? Are you horrified? Um, how are experiments going to be done, both by researchers and by campaigns in the future? What do you think? Th that's a that's interesting. Okay, so wait, so so I want to quickly follow up on something that Nayla said. I'm going to sure. come back to that if that's okay. Uh, <clears throat> and I think I think you were getting to this point where like there 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 may be some seriously powerful implications. Um, for digital home style, for 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 earned media, with respect to party power, right? If if you're not reliant on the on your on the Democrat or Republican party to get elected, that that's kind of new. I mean, um, and it's it's unusual, and it and it will change the dynamic uh, with respect to 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 how organized and how powerful political parties are in this country. They're already fairly weak compared to other countries. So it strikes me as like an interesting thing to, to sort of keep an eye on. Um, okay, so back to experiments. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, I think, uh, look, um, experiments are uh, very difficult as, as I just showed. I think that a lot of experiments are going to be, that were possible in the past, are going to be impossible in the future. Like most of the experimentation that happened in 20. 12 and 2016 just isn't wasn't possible in 2020 and a lot of the stuff that we did in 2020 isn't going to be possible moving forward just due to platform changes due to data regulation due to a bunch of different things which is fine uh probably uh because the effects are really small anyway and um it, i'm not sure yeah i mean like experimentally informed campaigns are probably more effective, but it's not clear that platform experimentation is necessarily the way to do that. Uh, the The last thing that I will say here is I don't think we should be horrified really either way, unless we're really, really concerned about heterogeneous treatment effects, about micro-targeting, and about like whether campaigns are going to pursue more and more data and we're going to have more and more privacy issues come up because campaigns are just hungry, hungrier and hungrier and hungrier for more and better and more fine grained and higher quality data. And I don't, I don't know that like, if there's no such thing as treatment heterogeneity, if microtarding doesn't exist, should campaigns do that? No, they, they shouldn't. And so like maybe, maybe this is like the happy ending of like not actually having uh, heterogeneous treatment effects uh, observable and findable on campaigns is that they won't be incentivized or as incentivized at least to do the shady micro-targeting stuff that we're all uh, fairly concerned about. Um, I think I think this actually raises a really good point, which is that you know we have to. <laughs> I, I think it's wise for us to be careful how much we sort of like blow the whistle about micro-targeting if it if it doesn't have these kinds of effects. Because the more we do that, the more campaigns see that as a shiny object and try to get more and better and crazier data, which just like isn't, it, it probably isn't that useful anyway. <laughs> uh, Cambridge Analytica data was totally useless with respect to uh, actual effects on elections. Uh, and so we, we would be unwise to, to say otherwise. 
Um, yeah, that, that touches on, um, your answer touches on um, the just general topic of just tran transparency, right? And how, um, how we might uh, be able to, um, you know, monitor, just like have a general, like be able to characterize what is happening in the digital campaign space. Um, Katie touched on this as well in a very interesting way, suggesting almost that, um, you know, uh, transpar increased transparency um, offered by some platforms may have driven some campaigns to other platforms that had less transparency. Um, and so just to sort of kick this out to the panel, anyone who wants to respond um, to this, um, I'm curious, like, are we just sort of destined to sort of play a game of whack-a-mole? Um, uh, like, is transparency actually, um, it, is it just something that comes with trade-offs, you know, along with, with every other sort of policy consideration? Um, as opposed to the general kind of orientation that we tend to hear, which is that, you know, sunshine is the best disinfectant and there can't possibly be anything, um, you know, bad that could come of more transparency. Um, so, you know, uh, I, so, so as a general question, you know, how should we try to approach, like from a policy or research perspective, um, like generally characterizing the kinds of tactics uh, and investments that are being made by campaigns in different platforms and like, should we care and does it matter? Uh, Kate, uh, Kate uh, if you want to say anything. If you want to yeah. go first, I'm happy to. Yeah, sorry. It's going a little in and out, so I'm trying to, I'm trying to make sure I'm keeping track, so forgive me. Um, I, listen, we need transparency. We need more transparency, whether it is um, these political ad libraries, more transparency in terms of, of data from these for the platforms and stuff like this. And this is the perfect example of why regulation is needed in this space. Because if you allow it to be self-regulated, some will choose to do it, some will not choose to do it. Um, and you will run into these issues where uh, some folks will, will go to different places. I think for the most part, I wanna make sure I'm really clear though, I think for the most part, part of the reason people move to different places is, was not, some of it did, was because of the transparency, but the vast majority that I've heard from is mostly because um, places like Facebook and Google and others have restricted the amount of micro-targeting you can do of these ads, and that has not been restricted on some of these streaming platforms and stuff that they went to. So I think it was more of the effectiveness of the tools uh, versus, versus the transparency. But it is something to think about because when you look at the bad actors, they are the ones who are now going to these other places and these other platforms that don't have the tools built up, that have different philosophies um, on this work, and it will make it harder for people to track these unless they are forced to actually be more transparent. Yeah. Salma, did you want to respond, or any, any, anyone else? Go ahead. On the topic of measurement being hard, I think one thing we're going to see is campaigns will still be on the platforms, but they will um, manipulate the tools right up until the point that they feel it's not legal. And our, our legal framework is relatively weak compared to um, other countries, but we are seeing this come out with um, some settlements around um, employment ads and housing ads and things like that. And so now we see a political advertisers on Facebook, for example, now that targeting information is available, they're just using proxies. Um, so you see, um, you know, they're targeting um, people who like NASCAR and um, that, that kind of thing. And, and that makes it hard for us as social scientists because now we have to try to understand um, the proxies and the, the cultural components, um, but I think we're still going to see them uh, using multiple platforms, but just in different ways. Okay, I agree with everything that, that, that both panelists uh, have, have said about transparency, about um, regulation. I, I, the one thing that I, that I think it, it's worth kind of noting um, are just sort of like like what is the the 800 pound gorilla, so to speak, uh, for for campaign advertising? Right now, it's probably still Facebook, um, and because Facebook has restricted sort of targeting, because Facebook has restricted uh, the 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 sort of like set of tools that it makes it available to advertisers, and and because of ad transparency, uh, the the ad archive, I, I think you know it does it, you know it's not that it doesn't matter. And it's not that it's just whack-a-mole because 
the vast majority of people that campaigners want to target are on Facebook or Instagram, and they're not really on TikTok. Probably young people are on TikTok, but that's not the vast majority of the people that they want to reach. Facebook's sort of market penetration that you in the U.S. at least is ju- just dwarfs everything else. Still, TikTok is widely used. And, uh, uh, YouTube actually maybe is the only potential competitor there. Um, but it's a, it's a different kind of advertising, actually, because it's because it's streaming. Anyway, okay. So the the other the other sort of like um, eight hundred pound gorilla thing here <laughs> is is that like most of these most of the sort of like the the advertising that you would want to do on TikTok is just different than than what you what you do on Facebook. Um, it's a different platform. It's 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 not clear that you. That you that the same tools are available, that custom audience matching, which is be, because of the of the way that that most campaigns target, which is using the voter file. They love custom audience matching. Um, I don't know. It's possible that TikTok recently developed that. Um, I haven't I haven't kept up with with TikTok. I feel I feel old now. But but the point is is that like that is that is what uh, you know that's what matters. It's important to keep these things in mind when we're, when we're thinking about you know. Should we give Facebook credit for, for, for this ad transparency thing? Yeah, probably. Should we pass regulation, standardizing things across the industry? Yeah, probably. Great. Uh, I think, so we, sat, we have some time for questions. Um, so if anyone has any questions for any of our panelists, please. Uh, yeah, Esther, do you want to? Yeah, do I need a microphone or no? If you can just repeat the question. Oh. I can repeat the question. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. And should I introduce myself? Please. Thanks. Esther Hargitay, um, CITP fellow and in University of Missouri Communication Studies. So first, uh, kudos to the organizers because this is a super interesting panel that raises a million questions. I'll stick to one for now. Um, so Sal, you, you mentioned, and I think this links very interestingly to other comments, especially Kevin's about the whole experimentation, but you mentioned that Trump is the one that other campaigns might want to emulate. and. Um, but my question is, how many Trumps can one campaign season actually tolerate, right? Like, would it work if you had three? Is that this back to the whole attention economy issue? Is that actually possible? Is that realistic? <laughs> right. So, so, so the question is, is, is kind of. There's this power law distribution of, of, of candidates and, and how much attention that they, they sort of suck up. The, the, the attention distortion is, is sort of distributed very, very unevenly. Um, and there are, are candidates like Trump where it's just way out in the tail and there, no one can ever hope to really compete with the amount of attention that that, that candidate is, is generating. Um, and, and yes, you know, there is absolutely no way that the dynamic would be the same if there were three uh, uh, candidates that generated as much attention as Trump, because you know time for media slots and and people's sort of attention spans are are not unlimited, and so yes, it's not possible that that sort of in a market equilibrium kind of sort of way of thinking. <laughs> that every campaign could follow the the sort of like last bit of advice that that the, the strategy should be to generate as much earned media as possible. So, but then what is the lesson learned from Trump's case in that sense? Oh, I, I'm not I'm not saying well I'm not saying that campaigns shouldn't try it. I'm just saying it's it's not it may not be feasible. Um, uh, campaigns should probably still. I mean, look, it's very clear. It's very clear that these sorts of things are very beneficial or that they have a very high sort of cost benefit ratio. Um, if you can be create, if you can sort of take risks and be creative, that is going to benefit your campaign. Um, just talking purely from a, from a strategy perspective, it, it, there, there's, you know, you can, you can, you can advertise in the Super Bowl um, and spend a ridiculous amount of money and still not generate the same kind of, Buzz and the same kind of, you know, uh, uh, 
insanity that that a, that a well-worded tweet or a or a sort of spectacular uh, media appearance, media stunt might might generate, right? The influencer. Yeah, so I would just say that I think the lesson is you don't want to play the not Trump strategy and have the other party play the Trump strategy. So that is clearly a disaster. So the equilibrium response is for both parties to play Trump, and then it will be very annoying. But I think that's <laughs> what's going to happen. Yeah. That's okay. Um, okay, any... Uh, yeah, uh, Mihir, did you want to? Okay, we have a question right here. Hi, my name is Surya Matu. I'm a, I'm a CITV as well. I'm just leading this thing called the Digital Witless Nap, and I'm talking next. Uh, my question is about the same topic. One thing that was really interesting for me is this idea of multiple new platforms and different strategies that work for different platforms. Um, you know, this whole like, sorry, I didn't do social science in undergrad, but like medium is a message is my kind of level of media theory understanding and thinking about how what works on Twitter versus what works on TikTok versus what works on Be Real or any platform that comes up now. I'm curious how much the effect of a particular platform matters versus the effect of media paying attention to particular platforms and raising the awareness of that to the broader audience. Who wants to take it? Just briefly. Yeah, I mean, this is a, a very complicated question. I don't think that if empirically, I don't think that this is knowable, really, certainly not a priori. So there are different certain platforms that are different from other platforms. But once you break it down to specifically on the back end from the advertiser's perspective, does TikTok have the same products that Facebook has? That requires a level of like detailed attention that I don't think is really exists yet. And I, I mean, more from a campaign strategy perspective, mm -hmm. like do people target a particular platform better because their candidate is more suited to that because they think that will generate more buzz versus... Like I, I do think we're just starting to get there where people are taking this seriously as and like not just treating... Right, I mean, the, the first online newspapers were just a printout of the front page of the New York Times. Right? So if we just treat each of these new mediums as if it were the same as the old medium except with a different wrapper, we're not using it to its full potential. But I don't think we have been going for long enough and particularly not developing candidates with the skills to really take advantage, full advantage of these different platforms. Um, I would just add, I think they're, they're going to have to have a cross-platform strategy because the platforms themselves are not mutually exclusive. Um, every, every news article now has a few tweets that they're quoting. You know, if you go on Instagram, you see TikTok videos that people have cross-posted. And so I think they're going to have to try to do everything at once, even though it's going to be difficult. Yeah, and, and then the last thing that, that I might add there is is that it, it, is, it is true that certain platforms do incentivize certain types of content. Um, the, the content that's incentivized on YouTube is just very different than the content that's incentivized on Twitter, in part just because of the structure of the platform. Um, you know, on, on Twitter, there's there, people like certain things, and I did some research, you know, my group did some research at, at Pew showing that there's a feedback loop where candidates seem to really, really like that sort of engagement that they get. The comments, likes, reshares, you know, the, the, the bread and butter of social media, and then ranking algorithms make that content more prominent. And there are certain factors associated with engagement in terms of the content that you produce that are going to give you a much broader audience and are going to give you a much different set of people involved, particularly because now everyone's moving sort of toward this sort of TikTok global distribution platform, which makes engagement even more privileged than it was in the past. And so it really does change the, the kind of uh, message that's going to succeed, so to speak, and that's going to be thought of as a success by campaigns um, compared to traditional video and traditional press interviews. Which is still that is still the dominant communication, you know, strategy uh, for most communication shops that that consultant firms. But that's what I mean. That that I at least have 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 worked with and talked to. So it is. It, I mean, it really is fundamentally different. It's true that the medium is still, you know, is the message.
I think. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Awesome. All right. So, hi, my name is Jolly. I'm here at Princeton. I'm also a panelist later in the day. So, uh, your opening statements all really resonated with me that fundraising metrics are easy and impact, um, persuasion, impact, more broadly speaking, is much harder to measure. So, thinking about this from a principal agent perspective, right, where campaign vendors and consultants are supposed to serve the interest of campaigns political organizations and their donors. And these eight principles ultimately want to see impact, but we have an intermediate measure that's observable, though not really the thing that they want. Uh, so I wonder, and this is a question for all of the panelists here, to what extent are donors, candidates, and political organizations not only cognizant of the problem, but trying to sort of de-emphasize fundraising as the end goal, or do you think currently they're still preoccupied with that intermediate goal? Um, so, so I love this question for a bunch of different reasons. Um, uh, essentially, there are a number of kind of principal agent misalignments in this process. And it's just actually the reason that acronym structured itself the way that it did, where you have creative, you have the actual ad buying, and you have the actual measurement in-house to actually avoid some of this principal agent um, problems that, that, that have been hypothesized to, to come up all the time. Right, and it gives rise to this sort of like disdain for consultants, uh, in particularly in DC. And it, it, I think, you know, to some extent, it's true um, that if you're the one doing the measurement or you're the one doing the the fundraising, you may or may not have the best interests of your 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 kind of uh, uh, clients uh, first and foremost. Um, and this is, I think. One of the reasons why we actually did a different, we, we actually used a, a more rigorous testing method to measure the effects that we were generating. Okay, now getting back to the sort of like the last part of your question, which is the fundraising piece, it's not, I don't think, the case that most of these campaign shops, at least in my sort of experience, it isn't necessarily the case that they just want to raise money and that's the that's the end goal the end goal is to win the election right and a lot of these groups the way they operate is that they they only exist for one or two elections they don't persist the 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 obama for america campaign of 2008 did i don't even think shared much data with obama for america 2012. i mean if that's happening then like all of these little groups that pop up and then die they're certainly not keeping the sort of like they're not keeping themselves together and so what this means is essentially like there's no kind of long run there's no shadow of the future there's no kind of what well, there is a little bit but not that much um to where it's fundraising 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 that's the only goal that's just not it it's also typically the case that uh these these shops raise money from big donors who just totally understand that this this money is going to go it may or may not su succeed and they're going to continue to donate in the future and so like that's a that's a little bit of a different dynamic right than than this like than 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 what you might think could happen which is that they're just optimizing for 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 fundraising because people care about money it's just it's unfortunately not the way that it no, I think for sorry, unfortunately, it's fortunately not the way that it works. I think we also need to think about um, tiers of campaigns because we have campaigns that are very established and well known, and they're going to have a different perspective and different types of principal agent problems than um, campaigns that are on the margin. And so I think it's those marginal campaigns that are going to really focus on the money because money is is necessary but not sufficient um you know bloomberg tried to just buy the primary campaign and it didn't work right um or uh 
so we know you can't just throw fifty million dollars at Facebook and think that that's going to be it. Um, but you really, um, it, it's very clearly established. Um, I mean, there's limitations on how much we can rely on the past, right? And things might change in the future. But um, you need the money. The money helps you do all the things and keep your organization running. It helps you buy more of what you need. Um, and there's a very clear relationship between the fundraising and the outcomes, at least to get you into the arena where you're competitive. And then once you once you are competitive, then it's a different story. So I think we do need to also keep in mind we're going to have different um, groups of types of campaigns that are going to have different strategies. Um, oh, else? Here, go ahead. Uh, yeah, go for it. Okay. Uh, let me just uh, you know, I think um, Mahesh Rasaga from CITP, I guess uh, we've been talking and I think there's a tendency to talk about campaigning as the presidential campaign. But that's obviously not the, the majority of campaigns. Uh, how do you see some of the insights you have playing out at st the state and local level uh, where some of these ability to reach voters, to fundraise, to use these tools uh, could be quite impactful? Uh, but you know, how do you actually go about measuring that, and how do you uh, go about analyzing that? Is that who wants to take this one, uh, or Katie, or anyone? Yeah. Katie, Katie, did you hear that? <laughs> it was. I heard local campaigns, but then I missed the last part. It, it's the, just the the question was, you know, when you have state and local campaigns, uh, how do these things play out at that level? We, we tend to normally talk yeah. about presidential, but how does it play out at the state and local level? I mean, in, in, I actually think that these tools can be much more impactful on the local level. Um, A, because of the micro-targeting and the ability to make sure that you're only talking to that very specific, that very specific district. But then on the organic side, you can actually probably manage the actual engagement and the comments in other places in a way that you can't when you're at a presidential and you have that level um, of stuff that you're doing. I have a friend here in DC who ran for a local office in Cleveland Park, which is a neighborhood in DC, and she was using digital quite a bit um, in order to introduce herself to her community um, and things of that nature. And when I was at Facebook, one of the things that we um, were, or at least I know the civic integrity teams were really looking at was how these issues might play themselves out at the hyperlocal level because one of the challenges while there are a lot of challenges to scale and you want to pay attention to pieces of content that get spread to a lot of different people there can also be some very problematic stuff that can come from uh, certain pieces of content getting to a small a small number of people so absolutely has an impact and is definitely something that we um, folks need to continue to pay attention to thanks um i think we have time for maybe one more question so you want to respond yeah go for it yeah I, I want to quickly say two things in response to that to that really good question um, which is that first of all uh, there's 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 a there's, there's like the overall visibility of a candidate that we that we often kind of take for granted in presidential elections and that is one thing that is actually really fundamental that you can do with some of these tools um, that 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 we're talking about today you can you know target state at the state level you can target at the local level you may even be able to target at the block level uh on on various platforms and then really increase your visibility among this group that really matters and do it in a way that's not wasting a ton of money um uh you know the the extreme opposite being like a super bowl ad the other thing is that um it, local and non-national and, and, and particularly non-presidential campaigns, I think like they, they're really different with respect to saturation. Um, the, the, the environment, the information environment, the, the ad markets, they're, they're totally saturated at the presidential level and they're just not at these, for these local campaigns. Um, and so it really does change the, uh, the, the impact um, and you can see this play out in a, lot, in a lot of empirical political science. You can see it and play out in everything that we did. When when the kind of when the the salience of a campaign is low, advertising dollars matter a lot more, and these sort of like earned media, uh, 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 quote unquote, dollars matter a lot more too. Okay. Can I just say it quickly? 
Yeah, yeah, go for it. Um, so, as a sociologist, I feel like the need to push back against the idea of medium as the message. Um, <laughs> so, so I know that opens a lot, and you know we have like minus one minute, but. Um, there are a lot of other factors, and I, one of the things that I'm a little confused by in some of the comments is when you all refer to platforms, it's, I think sometimes you're referring to the technology, maybe sometimes you're referring to the users, and it's a little bit hard to follow, um, but it's important to recognize that a lot of what makes a platform a platform is who's on it, um, and it's just, it's a little hard to know what you're referring to at different times, so just a thought. I'll, I'll, I have more, but I know we're out of time, so. <laughs> Okay, I, th I think we're we're over time. So thank you uh, to our panelists uh, for a fantastic uh, discussion, and thank you all. My name is Rebecca Weiss. Um, I'm the moderator for the second panel today. A um, little background on me, just to give a little sense of why I'm interested in the subject. Uh, I used to be the head of data science at Mozilla. And before that, uh, or during that time, I was also the creator of Mozilla Rally, which was a data sharing platform for these public interest projects. Uh, we were mostly known for collaborating with Surya and Matthew on, uh, from the Markup on something called the Pixel Hunt Project, which revealed that the tracking pixel from Facebook was sending uh, sensitive patient information from about a third of the top 100 hospitals in the United States. Um, so talking about this panel, the thing that we're trying to focus on is how do you monitor campaign advertising activities when these platforms in which advertising can happen may or may not actually be able to help. Truly, ground truth would come from these platforms, but in terms of their ability to self-regulate, I will just reveal my own cynicism here. Um, this comes from a place actually of deep impatience. I think that uh, what we're all thinking about on this panel are alternatives to waiting for platforms to open up the doors, so to speak. Um, so this panel has a lot of what I would qualify as researcher builders. Um, people who are making experiments or tools or building other services or solutions to try to create sort of alternative sources of truth to these problems. So because we have so many remote panelists, I'm going to try to be a little bit active in putting people on the spot a little. So I'm going to start with introductions. So the format of this session will go, um, all of the folks will give a little bit of time to talk about the work and the things that they've been doing in this space. Then we have a couple of prompts which I'm going to uh, ask the panelists to respond to. Hopefully we'll have about 15 minutes or so at the end for Q&A. Okay, so with that, um, let's, to make this easy for the panelists as well, um, I'm always gonna try to uh, give the remote folks a chance to speak, and then I will try to give the folks here in person a chance to speak. So I'm gonna try to go alphabetically first on Zoom by last name, um, and then we'll do everything in person here regardless of last name. Uh, so first, uh, Sasha, could you please give a little bit of introduction to yourself? Um, I'll give a little start. Um, currently, Sasha is the Assistant Professor of Computer Science as well as Public and International Affairs here at Princeton. She is focused on societal impact of AI, fairness, and privacy. She's also led a lot of work on algorithmic auditing, particularly on advertising delivery mechanisms. Um, prior to Princeton, she was also an Assistant Professor of Computer Science at USC. She's been a Privacy Advisor at SNAP. She was also a Research Scientist at Google. So with that, um, Sasha, would you like to give a little bit more uh, of your work? Uh, thanks so much for the introduction. So sorry, I couldn't be there in person. We're having endless uh, health issues here with my family. Um, so today, uh, what I wanted to talk about is uh, the role of the algorithms that platforms deploy in uh, delivering uh, political, co uh, po political content. Uh, up till now, the discussion has been mostly focused on what uh, political advertisers do and the uh, transparency on their actions. And I want to bring to your attention the fact that we should also be focusing on what the platforms do. So specifically in advertising, it's a two phase process. The first process is the first part is when the advertisers select a target audience, upload an ad creative, enter their objective and budget, uh, and kind of have the, their campaign run. But there's the second part, which is the delivery algorithm. This is when, for instance, in Facebook's case, uh, the platform uh, bids on advertisers' behalf. It runs an ad auction to select who is going to be a winning advertiser for a particular um, user attention slot. 
And then it also determines the price that uh, this advertiser will be, char will be charged. And I want to say that uh, this delivery algorithm is uh, very opaque. So what is known about it is that it's an auction. And what is known is that the ad that wins the auction is the one with the highest total value, which is a combination of factors such as bid, estimated action rates, and ad quality on, and relevance. But all of these factors, bid, estimated action rate, and ad quality are, and relevance are controlled by the platform itself. So the, the platform, um, in this case, Facebook, decides uh, what the bid is on the advertiser's behalf. It decides what the estimated action rate will be based on some opaque machine learning algorithm. And it also decides what is the ad quality and relevance based on a opaque machine learning algorithm and uh, uh, some internal um, people who review the ads. So none of the de details of these ad delivery algorithms are known um, more broadly. And so the question that we wanted to ask is, uh, what is the role of this ad delivery algorithm for political discourse? Um, and the way we wanted to answer it, uh, you know, in the ideal world, we would uh, look at the algorithm, look at the data, and would really answer it that way. Uh, but uh, in practice, uh, we, we cannot have Facebook's cooperation for studying something like this. So what we did is we registered as a political advertiser and we used targeting capabilities that were available uh, on Facebook when we did the study, which was early in 2020, where we could target people based on their location and based on uh, Facebook specified behaviors, such as their interests in the Democratic Party or interests in uh, Trump's slogan, make America great again. Or uh, their behavior, which is Facebook determined whether they're liberal and conservative. We also utilized publicly available voter records. And then we would run advertising campaigns and look at the campaign performance reports, just like any advertiser would. So we would only have access to what any advertiser has, which is uh, the breakdown by age, gender, and location of our campaigns. Uh, and the first uh, question we wanted to ask is whether our hypothesis is actually correct, that the um, ad delivery algorithm plays a role, or is it only uh, perpetuating how individuals are clicking on the ads and simply projecting individuals' interests? And to do that, what we did is we created four campaigns that for the real users looked completely identical. So for the real users, the campaign would be the flag uh, with a slogan register to vote and the landing page of uh, USA.gov. So it's four campaigns for the real users, all the same. Uh, for Facebook, uh, we played some tricks so that for the Facebook automated crawler, the landing page would either lead to a copy of a Bernie Sanders uh, presidential campaign or to a copy of Donald Trump's uh, presidential campaign. And at the time, we, we, we did this with uh, Sanders because at the time uh, he was spending the most money on uh, Facebook, uh, on political advertising. And so what we see here when we run these campaigns that uh, they, d they deliver differently depending on whether they're targeting a liberal audience or a conservative audience and depending on whether the Facebook crawler sees the Sanders page or the Trump page. Specifically, the ads with the Sanders landing page uh, deliver much more to liberal users and the ads with the Trump landing page deliver much more to uh, the conservative users. And moreover, it costs about 1.4 times more for the ad Sanders ad to reach the same number of users in the conservative audience 
than for the Trump ad. So again, this is for the real users. This is exact. Everything is exactly the same. There is no Sanders. There is no Trump. For the uh, for the Facebook crawler, these are campaigns that differ only in the landing page, and Facebook is charging the Sanders ad to more to reach the same users than uh, the Trump ad. And then we also asked the question: Okay, this is a, this is an artificial ad, our creation. Uh, does this effect per persist for actual political campaigns? And what we did is we took two ads run by Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders, and we copied their creative, the text, the image, etc. And then we ran it ourselves and observed the performances. And so we did again, we ran four different ads. So for each ad, we targeted either liberal or conservative audience. For each ad, we chose the objective of reach, which means that we wanted to reach as many people as possible. For each ad, we had the same daily budget uh, and we observed its performance for a week. And what we see here is that the ads deliver to more users if they share the campaign's views. So um, on the x-axis, you can see the campaign direction. On the y-axis, you can see cumulative reach. And you can see that the Sanders ad delivers more to the liberal audience than to the conservative audience. And the Trump ad delivers more to the conservative audience than to the liberal audience, even though the ads are targeting equally. Uh, the liberal audiences and the conservative audiences, and even though they are willing to pay uh, equal amounts for both audiences. And moreover, the effect um, uh, of a cost penalty persists also for real campaigns. So it costs more to reach users who don't already share campaign views. Uh, so it specifically, Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump could be running the exact same campaign, targeting exact same audiences, but Facebook will charge them differently. Uh, their algorithm will charge them differently simply based on their inference that uh, the audience may be more receptive uh, to one political campaign's message than to another compa political campaign's message. And what this tells us is that we need to be looking not just at what the campaigns are doing, we need to be looking at what the algorithms that then take these campaigns and decide who to show them to, what they're, uh, how they decide this. So specifically, there's evidence that the, deliv the, the delivery currently is eco-chamber-like. There's evidence of differential pricing that the ad platforms charge campaigns differently to reach the same audience. And that also has implications for the discussion of uh, disabling micro-targeting micro ability for campaigns. Uh, because if one dis disables micro-targeting ability, then that gives the algorithm more control over the distribution of political messaging. And um, our final conclusion is that when you're striving for transparency, we need to focus also on the algorithm of delivery, not just on the campaign actions. Thank you. Thank you, Sasha. Um, I will now butcher your name, Orestes, but I'm going to try. Uh, so this is Orestes Papakiriakopoulos. Is that right? All right. Um, oh, formerly no. as a postdoc Better. here at CA. Oh, it, 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 you're still giving me points? <laughs> I still give, okay. Uh, formerly a CITP postdoc and currently now research scientist at Sony AI Research Ethics. Um, his research in the past has showcased political issues and provides ideas, frameworks, and practical solutions towards just, inclusive, and participatory socio-algorithmic ecosystems through the application of data-intensive algorithms and social theories. I also want to highlight that Orestes has rolled his sleeves up and actually built things. He built monitoring tools in addition to his research. Um, namely, this political dashboard that collects and analyzes political content from Twitter, Facebook, and 40 online news media sources focused on political topics in Germany. Uh, so, Orestes, I pass it to you now to give a little intro. 
Uh, thanks for the introduction and for trying to say my name. Uh, <laughs> there is no chance to be said correctly, so it's fine. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. Uh, Uh, let me know if you can see my slides. Yes, I think. Uh, yeah, before focusing on uh, the work that I conducted at CITP together with Christelle, Mihir, and Arvind, I wanted to give an overview of challenges in how researchers can do uh, research in the area based on my experience, uh, both in Germany and in the US. So. Um, I think that one of the issues is like we have different platforms that have decentralized and divergent tactics. They have different policies about ads, different ways their algorithms work. Um, and furthermore, uh, they we know very little about them. They are very, very opaque. Um, but similarly, um, campaigns are equally opaque and not equally different. For example, um, the Democratic and the Republican Party might follow different targeting camp campaigns. That means using different platforms to different extents in different ways. Similarly, how uh, advertising and campaigning takes place in the US can be very different to how it takes place in Germany and how it takes place in India. Uh, and uh, I think this makes a very complex environment that researchers try to understand and figure out and say how it works. Uh, and unfortunately, there are very limited tools to do so. So usually, like, if we are lucky, platforms have ad libraries which supposed to provide transparency on ads uh, or even APIs that we researchers can collect data from and do analysis and understand what's going on. Um, but usually these tools are limited and researchers have to go and find other paths. For example, perform qualitative analysis, which is a strong tool, but it limits uh, the generation of specific findings, for example, at the scale of an ecosystem. Uh, similarly, often researchers have to do extensive crawling, which a lot of times does not have full information. So the findings are not necessarily complete. There are also obstacles in being able to crawl platforms. So it makes it difficult to do these types of research. And similarly, as we saw before in the research of Sasa, you can try and do very sophisticated field experiments and understand small aspects of the platform, but really that's also a lot, very time intensive, effort intensive, money intensive, and so on. So, our research that we did uh, at CATP uh, and was published last year uh, focused, okay, like we need policy changes so researchers and the public in general can have more access on what goes going on, both about platform decisions and campaign decisions. And we said, okay, what do platforms give? They give us these ad libraries. So let's take them seriously, see their gaps, uh, enumerate them and based on them make concrete policy recommendations so we can potentially uh, generate real world change hopefully um, so what we did is we focused on the 2020 elections uh, in the us and we tried to see okay how did online platforms amplify or moderate campaign communications so our focus was the platforms themselves uh, and we looked at facebook google and tiktok uh, because they all use different uh, tactics. For example, uh, Facebook, you could, uh, the ad libraries included, um, uh, there were ad libraries and uh, campaigns could use the full algorithmic tools to target the electorate. On Google, there was ad library, but Google imposed specific restrictions about how targeting can take place, while TikTok did not allow advertising at all. Uh, but also it did not have a, a, an ad li a political ad library uh, or an ad library in general at that point. So we tried to see, okay, can really these ad libraries or existing transparency structures make campaigns accountable as platforms claim? Um, furthermore, we have regulations in the US for radio and TV and broadcasting in general. And we said, okay, if these laws applied uh, on on the internet and these platforms, would they satisfy the requirements of these laws? 
Um, and finally, do platforms actually disclose everything that they know about how this algorithmic mediation and that targeting process takes place? And unsurprisingly, um, we found, and unfortunately, actually, we found that the data are generally not sufficient to hold advertisers accountable. That is because the ad libraries mask or aggregate data to a large extent or hide information. Therefore, someone cannot be sure, okay, what campaign tactics uh, were applied, who was targeted, in which way, etc. Uh, we also found that, for example, there was no cost impression parity between advert advertisers, which would have been a requirement uh, if the broadcasting laws applied for platforms. Because, as we saw also in the previous presentation, like ad targeting is algorithmically driven and a lot of factors come in, uh, we, we, we did not find, we found that advertisers and different campaigns would pay different amounts of money for targeting uh, and for placing ads to similar uh, demographic groups. Um, furthermore, we found questionable moderation practices. A lot of content was only partly removed on the platforms. What does, what do I mean? Like we have an ad, the specific instance of its ad was moderated, but other instances of the same ad were not and without a specific explanation. And furthermore, especially on TikTok, and that's not TikTok specific, but it was, uh, we focused on TikTok in this case, we found a lot of influencers who were active on the platform and they were linked to, to PACs, to NGOs and campaigns. And there, there is no uh, transparency at all about the exact relations between these influencers and the campaigns. Uh, and also that even if, um, political campaigning officially might be not uh, allowed in forms of ads on the platforms. There are new ways to do that, and this is something we should take into consideration. Uh, and in our study, we made specific recommendations. For example, that uh, we hope we argue that campaigns should have a universal identifier across platforms when they place ads, so researchers can locate exactly how their tactics takes place and understand them better. Um, we argue that there is a need to regulate uh, and understand influencer uh, marketing and how this takes place because it will play a bigger and bigger role in the future. Uh, it is important to all, not only look at the platform, but uh, the campaigns, it would be good to have disclosure mechanisms as well, uh, so we can understand them better because they are also key actors. They actually also decide whom to target and why. Uh, and on the platform level, there's still a big issue in terms of definitions. So each platform holds a different definition of what is political and what not. And that skews a lot uh, which ads can be placed, uh, uh, can be placed and that can have uh, an asymmetric impact in many cases. Uh, we argue for the need that they disclose the criteria that uh, um, for uh, for how an ad is distributed to disclose uh, the ad parameters that advertisement is choose uh, when they place an ad and also how these ads are distributed and also how the cost of ads is calculated. And ideally all this information can be uh, shared to researchers in order to analyze and understand the ecosystems, but also to the general public. And the same applies for content moderation. It is important that it becomes more uh, transparent uh, and accountable uh, in order for also to ensure um, advertisers uh, parity. Uh, and that was it. Uh, I am looking forward to the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Orestes. Um, and now uh, for our final remote panelist, um, Christo Wilson is an associate professor in the Curry College of Computer Sciences at Northeastern University. He's a founding member of the Cybersecurity and Privacy Institute at Northeastern, and he serves as director of the Bachelor's of Science program in cybersecurity. He's also co-director of the National Internet Observatory, which I hope he's going to talk about. Uh, so with that, Christo, I pass it to you. Thanks, Rebecca. Uh, and hi, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so yeah, I, I'm Christo. Um, I'm a computer scientist by training. Uh, I, most of my research is broadly in the digital consumer protection space. And that cuts across a wide variety of topics, online tracking, 
deceptive user interfaces, um, online misinformation and disinformation, uh, and this thing we call algorithm auditing, which is a systematic approach to trying to understand how platforms are shaping our experiences. Um, so a lot of my research touches on politics. Um, for example, we've spent years looking at Google search. You know, is Google search uh, creating filter bubbles in the way that they present political content? Um, recently, we've been spending a lot of time with YouTube. Uh, so, you know, there's these, these perennial concerns about YouTube radicalizing individuals by the recommendations that they show. Is that true? You know, that is an answerable question uh, if you have the right kind of data and methods to understand the recommendation system. Um, you know, we've also looked at things like content moderation on YouTube. Uh, you know, there are these concerns that uh, content moderation uh, is biased against uh, political conservatives on social media platforms. Uh, again, you know, the platforms are opaque. It's not clear how they do content moderation, but this is a testable hypothesis. You know, so we've looked at actually uh, YouTube's moderation practices around this. Um, but the topic today is advertising. Uh, you know, so advertising is uh, one of these topics that's also near and dear to my heart. Um, you know, you've heard from Sasha and Orestes about just how complicated online advertising in uh, advertising is, and they were focused, you know, largely on particular platforms, right? Like, how does advertising and targeting work on Facebook or on TikTok? Um, a lot of my work on advertising has focused on the open ecosystem. So these are the ads that appear on just any website, right? A CNN or a BBC um, or in any app that you use. So take the complexity of advertising on one platform and now multiply this a hundredfold. Uh, when we're talking about the open ecosystem, there are literally thousands of companies that are tracking your behavior as you're moving from website to website, as you're using different apps. It's very hard to tell who knows what about you and what inferences are they drawing. And then when it, and then when it comes time to actually show someone an ad, right, that's also an auction driven process. There are many companies that run these marketplaces um, and you can't tell who is in the market. So who, who is actually vying for your attention? Um, so it's very, it's very often difficult to tell you know, why you're being shown in any given ad and even who was involved in serving it to you. Um, so the, you know, the opacity of all of this is just magnified many fold. Um, so, you know, there's, there's lots of ex interesting experimental and kind of observational work being done in this space to try to disentangle who knows what about you and what are the flows of data. Um, and then on the flip side, you know, who actually showed you this ad? Why did they show you this ad? Um, you know, so Rebecca alluded to a project that I'm currently involved with. With, uh, called the National Internet Observatory. Um, so this is a, a National Science Foundation funded project. We just launched it. The goal here is to put together a, a large panel of tens of thousands of US residents um, and to survey them. Okay, so we, we know things about their demographics and their preferences, um, but then also to give them software so they can uh, give us data about their online experiences. So what apps are they using? What websites are they visiting? And on high value platforms, we're actually recording exactly what people are showing. What did you see on Facebook, both in the newsfeed, but also in ads or on Google search? Right? Same thing. You run queries. What is Google showing to you? Uh, and what ads are they showing? Um, and so the mandate of this project is to make all of this information available to researchers. Um, you know, there is precisely zero money in the budget for my own research. Um, so my goal in the spring is to actually start building that platform to make the data available um, and to facilitate all kinds of work. And we want sociologists looking at this. We want the algorithm and platform auditors looking at this. We want investigative journalists looking for, at this. Um, you know, we want to facilitate the broadest range of research possible. And that absolutely encompasses political topics and political content being shown on platforms and advertising in particular. Uh, one of the data sources I really want is to start capturing every banner ad shown to every participant on every website and in every app. So we can start to see 
you know, across kind of the entire ecosystem, what uh, political targeting are people actually experiencing? And how is that linked to their information consumption patterns? Uh, how is it linked to their demographics, their political preferences? Um, and we can really start to tease out this immensely complex ecosystem that's really, really opaque. What is actually happening out there? Um, so that's the goal. This is all very lofty, and it's very early days for this project. Um, but you know, we're, we're very hopeful. Um, you know, I'll also give a shout out to one of Rebecca's former projects at Mozilla, Rally. Uh, a very similar thing, right? A big panel of people, experiments, trying to collect data from them to do social good and, and good science. You know, so I think there's a couple of these efforts now to really build kind of sustainable, large-scale infrastructure around data collection to facilitate answering a lot of these questions um, and really fundamentally address this information asymmetry. You know, the, the platforms know a lot about us and we don't know a lot about them. And I think that's a solvable problem. And I think we are working towards that. Um, you know, we'll, we'll see if we're successful or not. <laughs> I'm definitely rooting for you all. Uh, with that, I'm going to focus now on some of the in-folks, in-person folks. In -person folks. Um, I will start with Sylvia and then last but certainly not least, Surya. Um, so Sylvia is an assistant professor of government at American University. Uh, her work has focused on data-driven analysis of many critical components of the voting life cycle, so registration, turnout, campaign contributions. Um, she's extensively applied computational quantitative methods. Uh, to examine causal relationships, which is something that we in social science love to talk a lot about, not just descriptives. Um, and a lot of her work has relied upon using large voter files as well as other FEC data sets. Uh, so with that, I, we need to get your slides up. Give us one second. <coughs> Hi everyone, nice to meet you. Uh, while that's being up, uh, I just wanted to, um, I don't have a title slide, so uh, nice to meet you everyone. Uh, I am at the Department of Government. I um, work on uh, 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 parts of American politics and political um, methodology, but today I'm here to talk about um, how um, uh, we're, I'm going to try to talk about a, another set of platforms. So we've talked about Facebook, we've talked about Twitter, TikTok, you know, mostly in terms of like how, how does it contribute to fundraising and persuasion and turn out and so on. Um, but now I want to um, see if I can go. Okay, <laughs> great. Um, okay, so this is not working very well. <laughs> that's, that's all right. Um, but, uh, is that okay? Yes, thank you. Um, so, um, and I want to talk about on, on another set of platforms, which is the online fundraising platforms explicitly. And these are tend to get embedded in the platforms that we've mentioned. For example, if you see the Facebook ad library, you will see that a lot of them have embedded URLs in them, such as uh, for, for AppBlue, for WinRed, or such fundraising platforms. And I'm going to, again, they, they might seem uh, relatively minor, but they also have a role to play in this ecosystem. Um, my takes on the, what's the missing pieces of the puzzle are um, are a, a multitude, but uh, I can return to that because I think there's a like, prompt for these. Uh, so, um, yeah, thank you. So my research focuses on the following questions. So uh, campaigns can be very different in their approaches to, to donors and voters. And we, I want to, uh, I, I was initially focused on the role of small donors, like why are they contributing, who are they, what are they doing, how much are they engaged in politics, and so on and so forth. But I, then I realized that they cannot study small donors without actually uh, also trying to look at the, what I call the demand side of things, which is like, how are the campaigns trying to get the small donors engaged in Right, uh, and um, this is important because what we call the financial electorate or the donor or the um, uh, they 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 can be very very different from those that we're trying to target with um, with persuasion or turnout. Right, so they can be out the streets. Their strength of donations can vary depending on how much you get them engaged. Uh, they can be more resource. They they are known to be more ideological and. Uh, compared to voters, right? Uh, I feel like I'm a cyberpunk. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> but hopefully, uh, we'll survive. Okay. Uh, um, so, uh, why am I talking about Winred and um, Apple? Um, so, the, 
digital, uh, digital, with the digitization of campaigns, um, a lot of donations here are moving away from Pete Buttigieg wine case to uh, you know uh, uh, the Facebook ads or uh, you know Twitters or uh, uh, text messages that come with uh, please text um, you know four four five seven zero to this number and we'll get your donation processed because your information credit card information is already uh, has been entered into the system because you've already donated once and so on. Right. Um, was launched in 2004 and grew, uh, it grew very organically into this gigantic force. In 2020 election, Cycle processed uh, $4.3 billion, and that's a lot of money. Right? Uh, and the GOP tried really, really hard to act, uh, replicate Apple's success. It failed uh, spectacularly for 15 years. Uh, and come 2019, and Trump, McCarthy, and McConnell got together to really push for a top-down uh, approach to uh, uh, to coordinate this fundraising platform. And so, uh, in the in 2000, in mid 2019, when Red was launched, which was supposed to be the CFO equivalent on the GOP side, and it did and it did a uh, phenomenal uh, it did have phenomenal effects in the same cycle. Uh, compared to that, this was a very very young platform, but it uh, ended up processing two billion dollars. Right. Uh, so uh, I have I have been trying to identify like what is this platform? How should we understand it? And what role is it playing in this whole entire ecosystem? Um, so a couple of research questions that I try to solve, uh, or like research fields that I have to say is that uh, with Reddit, what we, uh, we consider, uh, and this is worked uh, jointly with James Yao Lee here at Princeton, uh, is that it's an evidence of parties as endogenous institutions. It's actually a top-down strategy to resolve a collective action problem of not having had that centralized coordinated fundraising platform. And I also say that how much they actually, how much do political campaigns ask and try to solicit donations uh, is although they are supposed to be tailored to their uh, to their audience, they are also strongly influenced by uh, platforms. How platforms suggest, for example, how much to donate, they can uh, significantly affect um, how campaigns end up behaving. Uh, how, uh, and. Uh, and I also work on persuasion rhetoric that's being shown on Facebook and Library, but I think there's been a lot of uh, discussion already about how that runs out. Um, so this is just a, a quick uh, uh, showcase of how uh, and this was like a top-down strategy from the, from the political elites as opposed to an organic road that was witnessed by Apple. But, okay, but back to digital campaigns, why is this important? Again, um, you would have seen, uh, if you were engaged with, uh, you might have seen if you were um, uh, donating to uh, campaigns and causes, some things like this, right? So on the one hand side, you're seeing a uh, fundraising um, uh, uh, re direct URL from, from Biden. This was 2019 May. Uh, and on the right hand side, you are going to see Trump and Pence campaign trying to raise more money on the web. Um, and um, again, subtle as they may seem, uh, the, the platforms uh, provide a room for the campaigns to engage in these kinds of activities. And again, how they behave can be moderated significantly by how platforms conduct and, uh, and become institutions. For example, um, WinRed uh, got into this huge um, issue of allowing can uh, campaigns to like have a pre-checked recur uh, recurring donation boxes that would um, seem uh, deceptive to a lot of uh, donors who weren't uh, very aware of fine print that came along with those fundraising platforms. And um, that, uh, whether to uh, um, outlaw the uh, fundraising and pre-checked boxes uh, became a huge fight between the Democrats and the Republicans. The Republicans uh, uh, were saying that you, uh, they were doing this in the liberal side as well. Why is this a problem now that we're doing it, for example? So again, the the choices at the platform level are also a significant factor into uh, how party uh, political elites and campaigns and, um, and and donors respond to it. 
Um, okay, so I'm going to try to skip that one. Um, so what, what kind of data do I use? So let me tell you that I am not, an, I have no connections with those platforms, and I have, uh, I'm, uh, and therefore I resort to a lot of web scraping, a lot of monitoring myself, trying to build those tools and make sure that my desktop doesn't fail. <laughs> <laughs> I've actually gotten an email from Apple once that, I don't know what you're doing, but please stop with the, with the <laughs> scrapers because yeah, they, they, it's actually affecting our traffic. I was like, I'm very sorry. <laughs> <laughs> my skills are bad. Uh, um, I would, uh, on my end, as a researcher, and especially as a non-citizen, we cannot explore options uh, such as uh, registering as a political advertiser myself and actually checking out like, what kind of details can I go into. Uh, it's, it's vital that I just keep a really, feel, have my eyes peeled and really monitor their activities on these platforms, but it's very hard to do. Um, I started this project because I thought I wanted to monitor how campaigns change their tactics on like fundraising pages over time. But then I realized that I can have absolutely no way to monitor a campaign activity uh, on digital fundraising platforms uh, entirely because how they send out um, uh, you know, fundraising appeals is just all over the place. Like, so I wouldn't like an archaeologist. I mean, like getting all those like fundraising links and trying to figure out what the campaigns are actually doing. Let me give you a couple examples. Um, so for example, if, if I limit myself to like that, I have saying like 40 2020 uh, uh, slash GS. That means a Google search. GS is Google search. And then uh, KDH, EMA, 9, uh, you know, 20, uh, 2019, uh, October 29, EOM. That means EOM is like end, uh, end of month. So I'm just, just trying to like figure out like and, and guess like what campaign activities are happening at the platform level. It's not necessarily, I think, um, an issue of uh, platforms themselves, but um, having this uh, opportunity to like extensively monitor what the uh, what the campaigns and elites are doing, even in such you know, relatively minor platforms such as American platforms, I think is a really, really uh, important activity that. Uh, need not be, uh, should not be overlooked. So let me end it at that. Sure. All right. Um, with that, then, let's, uh, like I said, last but not least, um, Surya Machu is an award-winning data engineer and journalist. Um, he's currently the lead of the Digital Witness Laboratory here at Princeton. Um, he has a history of working on stories that force action and response by um, a lot of these platforms. So in addition to being at the markup, the story that we referred to earlier, it's also at ProPublica, where he helped discover that Facebook allowed for ethnic affinity exclusion in their ad targeting. So with that, I will pass it to you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, nice to meet all of you. Um, so like everyone else on this panel, I am just for the first time coming to academia. So my background is a little different to everyone else here in terms of the kinds of outputs that we receive. Um, I work as a data journalist. And, uh, you know, Doing a story with data and investigation data for journalism is similar, but still kind of different than doing it for academia, I think. So different set of constraints, but also different sets of opportunities. Um, so I kind of want to talk about two projects I've done that I think are relevant to this, um, to this discussion. The first one is a project called Citizen Browser. This is a project I did uh, while I was at the Markup, which is a nonprofit newsroom focused on tech accountability. And Citizen Browser is a project uh, we conducted that allowed us to independently audit Facebook's recommendation algorithms. We were basically trying to do like the equivalent of like the Nielsen ratings of Facebook. You know, listening to Christo talk about the National Internet Observatory, I very much wish that it existed and we tried to do that. It would make me have less white hairs than I have right now. <laughs> um, but you know, so that was so that was our basically attempt at doing this. We limited the scope to Facebook. Um, we basically had a panel of 4,500 people, not continuously, but over a period of two years. Um, most of those were in the US, but we, we actually had two panels, one in the US and one in Germany. So what we did was we built a desktop application that we gave to these people, they downloaded it on their computers, and then they logged into Facebook through it once, and it basically ran in the background on their computers, uh, going to Facebook three times a day, um, and collecting a bunch of different data from there, specifically looking at ads, uh, ads they were being shown, links they were being shown, uh, ad interests they were being shown. So we would actually like do the whole like 
clicking on the ad, seeing you know what interest was coming up for it. Um, and then as well as that, we also um, monitored what groups they were being recommended and what Facebook pages they were being recommended. This was basically our attempt. So I'm back to my question. My previous, in the previous time, I brought up a question that the media is the message, and is because when I do these investigations, I think a lot about what are the signals that are available to investigate on a particular platform. So you know, when you're looking at Facebook, for example, there's a lot of work you can do with ads, a lot of work you can do with the ad library, but when you actually have access to the data from a user, things like group recommendations become available to you to, to look at and monitor, which you couldn't do if you were looking at for example, the Facebook API. And research has shown that Facebook group recommendations are one of the ways in which a lot of misinformation has spread in the past. It's one of the ways people get onto groups. It's more organic, it has less structure, but it does have an important influence on um, how people could receive content on these platforms. So we ran this panel for uh, starting in November of 2020 all the way to April of uh, 2022 more or less, and uh, collected a bunch of data. Uh, we did a bunch of different stories. The one that is most relevant for this uh, discussion is the story we did in January of 2021, where we found uh, Facebook was recommending political groups to people on their platform um, from November till January, even after uh, the January 6th riots, even though they had claimed to not be doing so. When we, we were able to do this because we were we had an independent data set of Facebook group recommendations. Again, this is not actually data Facebook even considers to be a user's data. It's just something that exists on their interface. Because of the way we were collecting the data, we were, we were able to capture it. Um, and it led to a couple of interesting things we found out later. So we did this story. Facebook denied it and sent it to Mark. He wrote, uh, wrote them a letter asking them about it. And then the next day, we saw a drop in the recommendations in our panel, which was great. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but then six months later, uh, thanks to the Facebook files investigation at the Wall Street Journal, we got a little more insight into what happened behind the scenes. So it turns out that when our story came out, an investigation was triggered within Facebook. And they started looking as to why would they recommend a, group, a political group. They clearly were trying not to, but they seemed to be doing it. And what we basically learned was that the way they were, uh, that they had essentially a caching problem. So the way they were defining a political group was a group that was uh, generating, that had political content shown in the last seven days. So if there was any group on Facebook that had content that they did political over the last seven days, they would blacklist that group and prevent it from being a recommendation. But there was often a lag between those last seven days and the cache of groups that were being recommended to a user, and because of this kind of feedback loop, it kept happening. Um, you know, right or wrong, I don't know, but you know, without this kind of independent auditing, we wouldn't have been able to measure that. Um, we had a really limited, there were lots of limitations of like what kind of data we could collect, what we could say about it, but this is why I think there's a separation between the journalism and research. Um, we were trying to just witness what was happening on the platforms and hopefully asking important enough questions that could then lead to more thorough studies and research that could be done by places like the National Internet Observatory. Um, similarly, we had a panel in Germany uh, in partnership with Sudarshi Zaitun, which was a, a big newspaper over there right before the elections, and we found that in our panel, uh, AFD, which was the popular cycling party of Germany's content be it organic or ads, was being shown three times more to our panel compared to um, every other group. Um, uh, so, so these are the kinds of findings we were able to get from our uh, our project, which are you know otherwise hard to do if you rely just on the API or data sets that you know, are made available uh, by these platforms. Um, so that's so that's Facebook and Citizen Browser. And another project I quickly want to talk about is called Blacklight. Um, Blacklight is a tool I also developed at the markup, which is a real-time website privacy inspector. It's basically a tool where you can go in and type in the name of a website. It goes and runs a bunch of different tests on it to see who's tracking you on this website. The tests actually are based on a lot of CITP research that was done here many years ago. And I, I basically kind of incorporated those into more like non-researcher accessible language. Journals is accessible language, and then they could essentially kind of run these tests on what's happening on different websites they might be using. And actually, just yesterday, I found that there was a report from Human Rights Watch, uh, which was looking into election practices in Hungary um, in, the pre in the 2022 elections. And they found that 
amongst a variety of other very disturbing uh, kind of techniques that are beginning to come up, that a lot of ad tracking was taking place on political websites even before people were clicking the accept on the consent boxes uh, that they were required, they were mandated to do by GDPR to consent to. So I kind of bring these two projects up because I think they highlight like one end of this conversation, which is kind of scruffy, not fully representative panels, lots of limitations, but actually meaningful anecdotes that can lead to questions and can you know lead to further variation of these platforms, of these systems, and hopefully kind of broaden the conversation. So with that, um, no, thank you. Okay. Um, so, again, given that we have remote folks, uh, what I did with this panel is that I gave them some prompts ahead of time to try to help facilitate some discussion. Um, my hope then is that we can actually give some deference to the folks who are remote first. Uh, I doubt we're going to get to all of these prompts. I'm sorry, I'm going to have to kill some of my darlings. But um, I hope that we can at least get through some of them. So, first question that I want to get to, which is something that Sylvia already alluded to. I think we already have some spoilers from all of you about the response to this question, but you know, there's ad libraries now. There's a lot of effort to try to bring more data to people who are trying to understand questions around transparency and campaign activities. But still some things that aren't there. So in your own thoughts and your own responses, uh, what are the most critical campaigning activities that are either measured incorrectly or are not measured at all right now? And please try to stick to just one specific example. Um, I'm very keen to hear this, especially given that there are a lot of different backgrounds here. Like we have algorithmic auditing, which is a very different sort of mentality and methodology than what you would get from like more um, conventional uh, quantitative social science. So with that, um, I ask the remote folks if you would please use Zoom tools uh, to indicate which one of you would like to go first. Otherwise, I am going to go with sort of an alphabetical by last name approach again. If not, let's just do it. Uh, Sasha, could you go first? Sure. So it's it, it's really hard to stick to just one. Mm -hmm. I want to say that even though there is the ad libraries, those ad libraries are very difficult to use to actually answer questions. It's not it's not a one click you download all data and then you can analyze it. You still have to crawl it uh, and so forth uh, to actually get the data. And like uh, Orestes alluded to in his talk. It's aggregated in such way in such ways that it makes it very difficult to study. So, for example, the targeting is aggregated in Facebook's library. The targeting is aggregated at the advertiser level. The delivery is uh, aggregated at campaign level. So, there is very difficult to make a match between uh, what is the algorithm doing. Based on the, based on how it's targeted versus how it's delivered. Moreover, even though there is information about campaigns using custom audiences um, and lookalike audiences, it's it's a it's a it's a it's a kind of like a binary. Either they're using it in most of their campaigns, or they're not using it in most of their campaigns. There is no insight into what they're actually doing there. Uh, so I think that's another place where more information is needed. And in the third place, there is no information about what are the campaigns striving for. Are they striving for reach? Are they striving for higher click-throughs? Uh, what is their campaign optimization and objective? So I would love to see, you know, a ad library where it's one one click download of all the data or not uh, extensive crawling that's needed, uh, where the information is per campaign and not just per advertiser, and where their information includes what is the campaign objective. Arrestus, I'm putting you on the spot now. Sure. From my end, I think what we cannot measure is what exists in the custom audiences. So for example, on Facebook, you can create a list of individuals and send ads to them. And to my understanding, and uh, this is a large part of campaigns in the US, uh, and that's something that we as researchers don't get access at all. Um, yeah, and I would like, I provide much more transparency on how campaigns target individuals, but also uh, detect like uh, problematic uh, targeting. 
Christo, I'm sure you have a laundry list, but I'm asking you to stick to the one that has been repeatedly brought up to you. Um, maybe I plug for, for advertiser transparency universally. Uh, I, I don't understand why this would only apply to political campaigns, and this gets us into trouble, right? As we see in a lot of people's work, what they define as political activity doesn't necessarily match what is considered political activity in general, which makes it very hard to study. And the line is very fuzzy. Um, I'll also briefly say that I, I am concerned about A-B testing, you know, the, the systematic exploration and experimentation on people to tune messages. It's one thing to look at just targeting in general, but how is that refined over time to, to really hone messages and do even more you know, specific targeting that process is entirely opaque and, and very problematic, in, in my opinion. Sylvia. I would really generally agree with everything that's been said so far. I think there are uh, details about a uh, platform and digital campaign usage that we don't even consider them to be key metrics that are being missed. That actually hold a lot of uh, details and insights about you know how uh, uh, political campaigns and themselves, how who politicians are connected to each other, like who references who, where are there any party directives and so on and so forth. Um, you know the ones that I mentioned, for example, like, like uh, I, I can't ever have like a comprehensive list of or redirected pages for fundraising for even a single campaign because I would have to like check every nook and cranny, like be always on TikTok or something to to see if anything's going on. Um, it's just that, and I don't actually understand from a researcher point of view, like how much is, for example, A/B testing or some form of micro targeting is utilized over a set of different campaigns. Right? If I list, lift, uh, limit myself to like 2020 or 2022 general election candidates, do I do I think that campaigns yes. are homogeneously applying the same level of A/B testing? Absolutely not. But I have. I have absolutely no idea to, to measure or garner that information. And so I get a lot of pushback. Um, I had a, a set of reviews recently on the ones that, uh, the paper that I have uh, with Facebook and library. Like, but this is all micro-targeted, yes? And I was like, probably not. <laughs> but I can't prove that to you. So I'll have to sort of wave my hands over that. So that, that was a bit of a shame. But And, and I think sort of like trying to, any sort of information or details that as a researcher would have something that I can understand and would, um, would be really, really helpful and for reforms and, you know, transparent discussions going forward. Um, so I basically agree with everything that's been said, so I'm going to go for a moonshot uh, and say what I really want is, a, like, you know how we have an accessibility API? I want an inspectability API. Hmm. So basically, rather than worrying about each individual platform and exactly what they're doing, I would love some kind of markup me method that they have to actually say what they intend to do with something. <laughs> and that's related to network requests, related to DOM structures, whatever it comes up, because who knows what happens in the back and it's so hard to get access to that. And finding some place to hold into account is something that's really hard to do and I basically got this great head trying to do it. And what I wish for is a schema or a standard that everyone has to fit into like an ARIA label. Where so regardless of if it's sick, because now we've all become experts in how the Facebook ad library works and how you have to scrape the Facebook ad library, but what happens when VRAIL becomes the next platform, what happens when you have seven of these platforms. Right? So like what I'm really looking for is some kind of mechanism for collecting data safely from real people in a way that they understand what they're giving us and don't have to distrust us. And like what you do in Rally, right? And that was why it was so successful. And I think um, like an example that I think does a good job of that is uh, Apple's privacy reports. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's the first kind of example that you're kind of looking at the data. But something like basically browser tools for mobile phones in a way that makes it easy for people to share data with researchers, journalists, and others with some kind of comprehensibility is what we need. It's a moonshot. I like moonshots. Um, so uh, I'm going to, uh, looking at time, I'm going to start moving us to another subject. Um, so m again, my personal interest in this area is that I sort of find it heartbreaking that you have so many researchers who have this institutional protection of being in a university. They raise money from you know, grants. They spend years working on something like designing a very intricate experiment or building tools to understand something. And then at the end of it, 
they publish their paper, maybe, <laughs> hopefully, um, and then it kind of disappears. So for all of you who've worked in this space, um, what lessons have you been learning from doing this kind of work? And my personal interest, again, specifically is, um, do you see a future where some of these things could have been turned into tools or services or platforms to continue this kind of monitoring activity f for the foreseeable future? Um, and what do you think that would look like in terms of the kind of support you would need to be able to make that happen? It's not free. I spend a lot of time thinking about costs. Uh, so uh, with that same story, I'll start from the alphabetical approach. I'm sorry, Sasha, I just keep picking on you first. So would you like to go first? Sure. Uh, so speaking about the costs, right, uh, one, one challenge that we encountered when we were running the experiments uh, I spoke about is that we couldn't use the traditional sources of funding for academic research, such as like the National Science Foundation uh, funds or even our university funds. Because when you run political ad campaigns, you become a political advertiser. Uh, you need to report uh, to the Federal Elections Commission and the university or the National Science Foundation are not fans of being reported uh, to the Federal Elections Commission. So we have to do it basically using our personal funds, um, which, which raises the question, like if, uh, if one were to study these things at scale, what could be the funding sources? What could be the funding model? What could be perhaps the exceptions to the traditional political reporting campaign, political campaign study for when it's done in the public interest? rather than to actually run political campaigns. Uh, so that's on the funding. On the, on the longer term of how, how to build uh, infra infrastructure here, uh, I think we're going to need some legisl legislative support uh, because it's very hard to be fight, fighting these systems one at a time where each one of us is trying to o overcome the challenges. Uh, we need legislative support that will say, okay, these are the questions that need to be able to study broadly by anyone interested. This is the kind of support that needs to be provided by the platforms, uh, period. Thanks. Orestes. Uh, from my end, I think uh, it's troublesome that we researchers spend hours, days, months, years in studying little aspects of the platforms and of these ecosystems. And at the end, we generate knowledge that it is very hard to transmit to public audiences and to really like make them understand or care about these things. Uh, and uh, um, I hope like um, that, like that's something that maybe the Digital Evidence Lab can facilitate uh, better, like to really like these findings that we get will be able uh, to be um, shared by the right people so change can take place. Uh, and I would say like policy is what is needed for sure for things to change. So platforms and advertisers and campaigns are forced, unfortunately, to share more and more so they can become accountable. Christo. Yeah, I completely agree that there's there's policy dimensions here. Um, you know, the things that keep me awake at night are legal risks. You know, I think about NYU getting completely sacked by Facebook. Um, I think about how when I'm building the observatory to access people, I need to go through gatekeepers like Google. And Google's also, you know, a target of the study. Um, they could make my life extremely difficult. Uh, and there's nothing I can do about that. Um, you know, this is not a technical problem. This, this is a policy issue of forcing more transparency, legitimizing data gathering, legitimizing research in this vein in the public good. Um, because the, when the gatekeepers are the subjects of the studies, uh, you, you can't, there's no way for, you know, anyone like us to disentangle that. We, we just don't have any leverage. I'm going to go back to the real world here, <laughs> Sylvia. Legislative support is going to be like absolutely um, crucial. I mean, represent what I mean. I wanted like longer like tools and platforms. 
um, I, I, I'm very jumpy and very, very chicken. Um, so I don't want to. Like, uh, the email, like this very minimal and gentle email from Apple saying that I don't know what's happening on your end, but please stop, really made me really jumpy. And, you know, it's great thing, like things in the public domain, even like how do I deal with the robots TXT, or does it, does it make sense? Uh, things like that would be uh, happen, I think, really some things that I, I was. I, I was struggling with in my initial stages of work. Um, uh, other than that, I would say, mm, uh, no, sorry, this, this is slightly unrelated, but can I? Okay, uh, sorry, uh, no, so I, I, I just wanted to, like, before my time ends, that some missing pieces, the batch of the missing pieces of the camp digital campaigns or campaigns overall that we don't understand. I think it's one thing about how campaigns excel and like um, purchase a donor list from each other. And we have absolutely no idea how that happens. And uh, people complain about which they give to one campaign and they can never stop receiving emails from a lot of different campaigns and, and candidates, right? Uh, and, and I think transparency on that end would be also necessary to kind of relate to prompt. Thank you. Um, again, I agree with everything. I think I'll just add that to get, it's from personal experience, to get the legislative change, you need persistent monitoring to show people that the thing keeps happening. And this is one of the challenges with academia often, is you do the paper and then you have to move on to the next thing, but people then think that it's solved because you showed it, but it often doesn't happen that way. I mean, this is like, when you were saying the ethnic affinity ads, we show those in 2016, clearly like the most kind of clearly illegal thing that you can define in the screenshot is still until 2022 for that to change. So I think you do need some methods to kind of keep the pressure on the companies and again coming from a journalism perspective, like that's what like Blacklight the tool I was alluding to earlier is trying to do. It's trying to give you language uh, for journalists and other, like, other members of civic society to be able to translate that sort of research into their own stories, into their own advocacy. So it kind of comes from a bunch of different places. Um, and I've just found that journalism, like investigative journalism has this like kind of interesting role where it's kind of like, it can be a really good like R&D cycle for a tech product, for a persistent monitoring tech, tech product because you really have to have a clearly understandable narrative, you have to have a public interest angle to it, and you have to have rigor. And once it's a pain in, the, pain in the butt, but once you do it, then it's something that can last for a while because you've measured something specifically that uh, you can keep measuring. And it's not the whole, the whole system, but at least it needs you to continue poking with it. So, so I want to give the room a chance if they, anybody has questions that they'd like to ask. Otherwise, I do have another question that I'm going to ask. So. Um, so I, I, do, I, want, I had a comment first. Um, I worked with a campaign, and so I um, worked with a campaign, and we discussed um, how disgusting these emails are that just drive people to give money. And the campaign agreed to change their approach. And they changed their approach for a couple emails, and their fundraising went down. And they came back to me and they said, oh, well, you know, we're really sorry, we really believe in this project, but we really need to first keep our campaign funded till the next cycle. So we have to turn on the disgusting emails back on. So that's sort of the mindset that every campaign is sort of under, which is they understand that what we're doing as a system is disgusting, but they don't understand how to get to the next step, and we're stuck in a sort of prisoner's dilemma, which is in a given cycle, if you try to do something different, you are going to lose compared to the other candidates. So I think that that's one uh, part of the puzzle that's important to understand. The other part of the puzzle that we mentioned and sort of, sort of got to what Sasha was saying is that we're looking at this as a system from the point of view of the monoliths, which is the platforms and the campaigns, but there's also the, the actual people that are being targeted. And I think that what was discussed earlier about um, uh, um, digital literacy is also important here. Um, we can never control the incentives of all of these big things, unless through policy. But what I'm curious is, so Sasha was showing how a lot of the propagation depends on how users share stuff. Um, and I'm curious if, uh, and then Crystal was talking about uh, digital literacy, about how ads, online advertising, it's the whole ecosystem that impacts. What I'm curious of the panelists is, have you thought about, based on everything you know, 
How would you explain this to voters, to donors? And I'll give just one example. So Surya, um, Sylvia, sorry, you were mentioning how um, the voters are different than the donors. The people who give money to campaigns are not the people who are voting on them. So one thing I tell people is, hey, giving out-of-state money is a bad thing for our system. These are not your candidates. You are not in that race. Do not give to outside campaigns. That's one thing that I'm trying to do to lower the toxicity of the system. So based on the research that you've done, what are suggestions that you would give to voters to try to walk away from this toxic system? I would actually, um, I, I actually am ambivalent as to how much of our district donations are, are evil. Um, well, let me first say that the established facts are that at least two thirds of congressional fundraising comes from our district. It is actually a part of a very, very big part of the campaign finance ecosystem at the individual level, donor level. Um, what so um, a lot of those donations come from you know wealthy states, a lot of large states such as like, uh, California, Florida, New York, and, and so on and so forth. Um, but I do believe that there are some benefits that the donors are getting. For example, they might be supporting collective candidates that are not necessarily within their own districts, and I don't think we have any jurisdiction to to actually say that that's wrong because that also contributes to the structure of representation. So I do understand also that um, hopeless candidates that will never win the election, but there are still in the system, will also get a lot of outstate donations, such as you know Amy McGrath, who uh, did get a lot of pushback because she was never going to win, and yet she had uh, burnt millions and millions of dollars in the 2020 election. So I do understand that, and I think sort of like uh, communicating like. Uh, about the efficacy of those donations, like um, the distribution of them, like how effective they are at that point, that's like taking this practical approach rather than uh, like a, a, a normative approach might be more helpful. It's slightly different than the topic that we were discussing. That's my take on it. Anyone remote like to add to that? Okay. I might take a chance then. Oh, sorry, Christo? Uh, I mean, I, I think there, there is a lot of opportunity to explain to people how online advertising works. You know, there, there's a lot of folk knowledge that's not right. People believe that Facebook is eavesdropping on them. Um, and it's, you know, that's not happening. But there are a lot of things that are happening. Um, and getting people to understand the degree to which they're being tracked and targeted and, you know, to help them disentangle these ideas that not everyone is seeing the same thing. And that by engaging with that content, you're actually revealing more information about yourself. Um, you know, I think there's some, some basic kind of defensive mechanisms that people can be taught without getting into all the complexity. Um, so you, on one hand, digital literacy is good, but on the other hand, um, we are talking about centralized actors with a lot of power, and I don't wanna push too much of the burden onto individuals to protect themselves, because there's an asymmetry there that's kind of fundamentally unfair. Yeah, I, I want to agree with Crystal. Oh, sorry. So, Keep going, Sasha. <laughs> yeah, I wanted to agree with Crystal that uh, I, I think digital literacy is very good, but it, it, there is a power asymmetry, and uh, we should not be putting all the burden to protect themselves on the individuals because they simply don't have the time and knowledge to educate themselves on all different aspects and privacy and algorithmic uh, manipulation and so forth. Uh, we should be putting efforts into uh, dealing with uh, big actors who have the power and uh, giving users control that way. Thank you, Sylvia. Thank you. Uh, just a, like a higher up. Higher and I think like what's happening currently in the like the contemporary American politics and political campaigns is that there's been so many failed uh, campaign finance reforms that a lot of the um, uh, it, it's actually forming into this very very romantic and strong view about democracy 
which is that a plethora of small and grassroots donations is going to save America. <laughs> and that's actually feeding into how campaigns work themselves, especially on the liberal side, right? And um, I, I actually really like this citation from Boston Royal. This is actually another paper that I'm trying to write, which is the small individual contributor is as sacred in the American polity as the small business owner in the American business uh, economy. Right? But I actually want to push back against that because uh, Americans need to step out of the US politics and actually see how campaign finance is done in other countries. And the amount of money that is being burned in the US politics and the amount of extortions that you know, the individuals are bearing the brunt of, for example, presidential campaigns, I don't think this is sustainable or anything really anything good. So. Uh, um, again, this is like a relatively good one to take on, uh, on this, uh, on this. We sort of diverge from our prompts, but yeah. that's just my take on it. Um, this actually does make me think about the first panel that we had actually in that, like, if you have these major, major donors that are forcing all of these other campaigns to burn money to spend on micro-targeting that may or may not be effective, um, it really does change the surface of the way campaigns are run in this country. So. Um, learning from other countries seems like a very wise idea. Uh, I think we have time for maybe one last question, so I'll hand it to you, Nalad. It's okay. So a lot of this work is adversarial when you think about the companies you're dealing with. And at the end of the day, you're coming up against capitalism, and that's very difficult. <laughs> um, and at the same time, you have companies like Apple, which are trying to brand themselves as like the privacy company. Do you think that there's a pathway to find some synergies with companies and to try to start some traction to make privacy and transparency profitable? I just want to add to your question, which is that the question I wasn't able to ask is that um, in, the, in Europe, the DMA and the DSA are creating a lot of opportunities for people to work on transparency is issues under the aegis of something like we're trying to promote competition or we're trying to um, promote fairness. And in the US, we don't have a similar approach. So which of these areas, like you're saying, like is it going to come out of privacy instead of 230 or is it going to come out of something else? So I'm very curious from the panel to um, here are responses to this question. Forcing you all to be kind of faux political theorists and institutionalists on the spot. <laughs> I can go first. Yeah, you want to go first? Okay. Um, honestly, whatever works. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, I, I think it, it's more just about like, how do you uh, incentivize people to care about that. Uh, and I think we're still at that stage of the problem. I think like, like what you're saying, like those legal frameworks seem to be creating opportunities to build products which have a different kind of value set than previous ones. But uh, personally, I still think open standards and like things that we can all kind of agree upon, or, like in a grander scheme, including like companies, advocacy groups, civic, uh, civic bodies, like not just like companies on their own because I think this stuff percolates so many parts of our life. We need different actors in the room as well. Mozilla is an example of an actor that um, is a competitor and has different incentives and then invested them in really doing amazing work on privacy and monitoring of duck duck goes in that example. Mm -hmm. Jean, uh, you want to respond? Yes. Sorry, I just very quickly chime in. I, I happen to know a lot of folks at business schools. There's a vibrant strand of research called self-regulation, including platform self-regulation. So uh, my understanding of the consensus of that, status, that, that state of work is that there are economic incentives to self-regulate, including providing more transparency or better user protection. But it's also rather fragile, right? It needs to be profitable. It needs to have coordination across industry. And it needs to actually be sort of well monitored, and there's an accountability system enforcing it. And there's also a lot of pretty credible research that has shown that industry self regulation can oftentimes preempt more substantive, more durable public policy changes. So, my personal view is we have to look at this with the, uh, with the dose of skepticism, is what I say. I will conclude with my one comment on that is that having worked in industry, um, part of my impatience and slash cynicism from all of the self-regulatory behavior that we hope to see from these platforms is that these often are just straight up cost centers. And if you're not a profit center, 
you, if there's enough executive churn, buy. So unless there's some form of legislative or regulatory act that actually forces something like this to happen, it will, you might see something start, but it will, it will resort to, it will, it will become its cost center nature over time. So um, with that, I think we are actually at time. Um, thank you to all of the panelists. This was awesome. I'm really happy to hear all the work that's been coming out. And I really want you all to reach out to the people here who are doing these things, since, like I said, it is not cheap and it is very hard to get this kind of work off the ground. So please reach out to these folks. Thank you.